Hello? Are we, are we Hello. good? All set? Uh, give me a second on your testimony. We're going to do our opening statements here, and then we're going to put you on. Great. Great. In the meantime, I'll mute myself. All righty. All right, we're ready. Sergeant Arms ready to go? Yep. All right, good afternoon. I am uh, Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee. I'm glad to be here with my colleague, uh, Chair uh, Justin Brannan, who's Chair of the Resiliency and Waterfronts Committee. And today we'll be holding a hearing on the seventh anniversary of Superstorm Sandy and hearing three bills intended to help address the triple threats of climate change, sea level rise, and sunny day flooding as we take steps to protect our 500 plus mile shoreline and city's nine million residents. The evidence is clear that is time, there is a time horizon when critical public, private, and commercial systems will be compromised by tidal flooding. Without additional investments in our infrastructure, New York City's coastlines remain vulnerable to the next superstorm. We hope that we'll be well prepared if and when it occurs, but we have no guarantee that we'll be ready. Superstorm Sandy caused an estimated $19 billion in losses in New York City. Another superstorm could happen tomorrow, and I don't believe we'd be ready. Our resiliency rep uh, preparations need to be better. The IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, released a special report on the impacts of global warming above 1.5 degrees Celsius pre-industrial uh, levels in 2018. According to the report, peak uh, temperature increases beyond 2 uh, degrees Celsius will lead to long-lasting and irreversible, ch irreversible changes, such as ecosystem loss. According to the IPCC report, temperature is already between 0.8 degrees to uh, 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. A likelihood of keeping temperature increases to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels diminishes every day. Uh, climate change is expected to continue exasperating extreme weather events, leading to stronger and more frequent storms like Sandy. Moreover, um, you know, families are still at risk. Uh, and you know, it's not only about the next superstorm, it's about the creeping of water on a daily basis that on a beautiful day outside, communities would vanish before our eyes with sunny day flooding. These are all the futures that we are attempting to stave off and the seriousness of the work that we must do. And we have a very short timeline in which to do this work. Uh, intro 382 would require the Office for Emergency Management to conduct a mailing upon the final adoption of a feder federal flood insurance rate map informing members of the public whose properties are in special flood hazard areas of flood insurance requirements and other relevant information. This law would take effect immediately. Due to the increasing amount of debris in our shoreline that results from higher tides, we also need to consider the long-term ramifications of plastic, wood, and other debris that impacts our coastal communities, surface water, and marine animals. Debris is routinely, routinely abandoned on New York City's beaches and shorelines. However, where debris is abandoned at the waterfront, New York City spends approximately $2 million annually to clean up about 0.33 cents per capita. There is also a stake program that performs beach cleanups in New York City in September and October. The vast majority of debris collected by the New York State Beach Cleanup Program are plastics. While the stake program is informal and works with volunteers, it is not entirely clear where all the recyclable debris is being recycled. This legislation will ensure that plastic debris is not landfilled when it could be recycled. Intro 1480 would require the mayor or such agency as the mayor to uh, designate to create a program designed to dispose of, recycle, or appropriate reuse marine shoreline debris left on our shorelines and public beaches. This law would take effect immediately. We have too many abandoned boats and abandoned uh, debris in our waterways. Uh, finally, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists study published in 2018, New York State ranks third in the nation for most homes at risk from coastal, coastal inundation by the end of the century. In the state of New York, 15,500 homes, representing a population of approximately 42,000 people, and valued at approximately $8.5 billion, mostly clustered in Long Island, uh, Queens, uh, chronically risk inundation by 2045. 
In particular, in Queens alone, the 2,700 homes at risk by 2045 are largely concentrated in environmental justice communities, those communities who can ill afford to move, who will be on the front line of climate change and are every single day. Why bro robust plans have been developed to address resiliency on Manhattan and the South Bronx, we need our entire shoreline to be protected in a connective way, in a holistic way. Intro 1620 would require the Office of Recovery and Resiliency or such office or agency as the mayor shall designate to develop that comprehensive five borough plan to protect the entire shoreline of New York City. This local law would take effect immediately. While we do not anticipate another superstorm tomorrow, we certainly have no idea when our best preparations will be required. However, we do know that we must act as soon as possible. Uh, we have to act yesterday because the serious of this matter demands so. Uh, so with that, I look forward to hearing uh, from my colleague and co-chair of this hearing, Councilmember Justin Brennan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Justin Brennan. I have the privilege of chairing the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. I want to welcome you all to our hearing uh, today, uh, seven years to the day since Superstorm Sandy uh, hit our shores here in New York. Um, I also want to extend my thanks to Councilmember Constantinidis, who chairs the Committee on Environmental Protection, for your partnership in joining us today. Uh, this hearing will provide our committees with an opportunity to hear from the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and the Department of Parks and Recreation regarding resiliency measures um, that have been implemented and the city's plans going forward. Seven years ago today, Superstorm Sandy in New York City inundating parts of the city with seawater left almost two million people without power, destroying approximately 300 homes and causing an estimated $19 billion in damages and lost economic activity. Thousands of New Yorkers were displaced, either temporarily or permanently. When Superstorm Sandy hit the battery, the storm tide was over 14 feet, almost four feet higher than the record set by Hur Hurricane Donna back in 1960. The city was not prepared for a storm of this magnitude. Seven years later, we still aren't. It is projected that the likelihood of another Sandy-type storm is now a one in a 25-year event. Yet seven years after Superstorm Sandy, many of the administration's proposed projects are still in the planning phase, and many of them are based in Lower Manhattan. Why? The city's raised shoreline initiative, shoreline reconstruction projects, necessary to provide citywide protection from future flooding because of sea level rise is not expected to be completed until the end of 2022, more than 10 years after Sandy hit the city. Why? We need to be much more proactive and on a faster pace to protect the city against a similar future event. And we need to make our waterfronts more resilient to be able to withstand flooding after routine rainstorms and high tide events. After almost every rainstorm, the Atlantic Basin area and Red Hook floods. Minor thunderstorms this past summer flooded streets throughout the city. These events are occurring more often because of climate change. In 2013, the city released a Stronger, More Resilient New York, which is a comprehensive plan with recommendations to rebuild Sandy impacted communities and increase citywide resiliency. However, seven years later, we are still relying on temporary measures. HESCO barriers and tiger dams, which are interim flood protection measures, were installed in Red Hook in 2017, five years after Sandy. While OEM designs a more permanent solution, sandbags stretch along Lower Manhattan and Astoria. In 2013, the city also announced the Build It Back program to help multifamily and single-family homeowners rebuild after Sandy. More than 20,000 homeowners registered for Build It Back. One year later, only about 8,300 applicants were still in the program. Although some applicants who applied were deemed ineligible because the property was not their primary residence or they had complied with flood insurance, they had not complied with flood insurance requirements, many dropped out of the program because of issues completing the paperwork and frustrating bureaucratic delays. The Housing Recovery Office did work to improve its customer service to better assist applicants and eventually worked out many of the problems with the programs, and we commend HRO on that. However, many eligible homeowners who could have used the assistance did not get it. And we look forward to hearing from the administration today on how to better prepare for when the next storm hits. In the seven years since Superstorm Sandy, the city has undertaken a lot of strides, a lot of studies, 
And most of the big resiliency projects are concentrated in Lower Manhattan. Lower Manhattan is an important economic and transit hub, and the people who live and work here need protection. But we also must ensure that the millions of people who live and work in each borough are just as protected. Many, many questions remain, and we hope to address them during today's hearing. What is the administration's long-term planning strategy for homes and critical infrastructure located in areas subject to repeated flooding? What is the plan for dealing with long-term impacts of climate change on the most vulnerable communities along our coastlines? Coney Island, the Rockaways, Midland Beach, and other low-lying areas in Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island already experience flooding events regularly. As sea levels rise and rain events become more and more intense, flooding in coastal neighborhoods will occur, occur more often, in some areas weekly. Intro 1620, Council, Council Member Constantinides and my bill to require the mayor to develop a comprehensive five borough plan to protect the entire shoreline, all 520 miles of it, from the effects of climate change is the first step. It will include long-term strategies to address climate change, sea level rise, and sunny day or nuisance flooding, and will help determine where the city should invest its capital resources. But immediate action is needed to help avoid and mitigate against the projected devastating impacts of climate change. While the city has constructed dunes in the Rockaway Peninsula, which are effective flood barriers, and we commend them on this, we must explore additional alternatives to hardened infrastructure, things like living shorelines. We know that such techniques will not be feasible along the entire city shoreline, but many low-lying neighborhoods will benefit from redeveloping and restoring natural features such as wetlands, which will help attenuate the impacts of waves and coastal surge. We look forward to hearing the administration's testimony and answering our questions about the measures they have taken and whether their planned projects will help this protect the city and the people who live, work, and visit the city from inevitable future storms. We also look forward to hearing from experts who study climate change, sea level rise, and flooding. Before we begin, I want to thank my committee staff, especially committee counsel Jessica Steinberg-Albin, policy analyst Patrick Mulville, financial anal analyst Jonathan Seltzer, and my senior advisor Jonathan Yedden, and of course council staff from the Environmental Protection Committee for all their hard work in putting this very, very important hearing together. Uh, I also want to recognize, I don't have anybody else here yet, but I'll now turn it back over to Chair Constantinidis to get started. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Brennan. At this time, we're going to hear testimony from Dr. William Sweet from the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Uh, Dr. Sweet, can you hear me? Yes, I sure can. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Uh, we're going to have you begin your testimony. Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, I'll talk about uh, sea level rise and what that means in terms of tidal or high tide flooding along the New York City Harbor coastline. Uh, I come to you today uh, from the group that operates all the tide gauges within NOAA's National Ocean Service. So we have many longstanding gauges there where we make sense of patterns and trends, as well as project into the future in terms of uh, increased flood risk and try to marry those uh, water levels to actual impacts on the ground so it becomes a meaningful uh, metric that I'll uh, be referring to today. So, everyone can hear me okay? Yes. yes, doctor, we hear you. Great. So, to put it into context, uh, I'll use some flood thresholds that um, are developed locally by your weather forecast office of the National Weather Service. Uh, these fresh these thresholds are um, developed upon years of impact monitoring, uh, and they relate to levels on our tide gauge. So, for instance, as you can see here, sort of the minor or what we've oftentimes called a nuisance flooding, uh, flooding or sunny day flooding, or now we're starting to call it high tide flooding, is more or less more tidal driven, less storm driven flooding uh, that is really starting to become noticeable in many low lying flat areas along the coast. Uh, I'll leave it to you all to really understand and recognize where those impacts more or less tend to recur, but one thing's for certain, recurrent flooding tends to have recurrent impacts. Um, moderate and major flooding obviously is, is a problem. It's more of a, a life-threatening situation, more storm-driven, uh, but more of the emphasis will be on sort of the, the first level of uh, noticing impacts on the minor 
uh, flood threshold, which oftentimes equates with a coastal flood advisory from your local weather, uh, weather forecast offices. Uh, we recognize that there's more than just rainfall causing impact, uh, or just water level causing impacts. Local rainfall, as was mentioned, is a problem uh, in itself, but especially when sea levels continue to creep up and storm uh, high tides tend to clog the stormwater drains, uh, oftentimes pulling into the streets themselves. The same uh, event that might be causing the waters to be higher might be causing rain as well. It exacerbates the problem. It diminishes the stormwater drainage capacity in many uh, parts of, of cities and municipalities. But I'll strictly be talking about it in terms of water level. Our tide gauges tend to not really pick up on localized rain effects. So we'll just look at this in terms of one process, the ocean and tides and storm surge associated with that. So uh, an old picture of where our Tide gauge used to be at the battery. It's moved since then, but there's just an iconic picture. Um, the, on the right is the actual measurements. Sort of in the whitish color would be the tidal component or the tide prediction of the water level, whereas the blue is actually what the water level is. In addition to the tides, we have weather, which will cause you know water levels to deviate from the tide alone. Uh, shown here would be these sort of minor, moderate, major flood threshold, uh, and most of the discussion today, again, will sort of frame somewhere between the minor and moderate flood, about two to three feet above the average high tide. Again, not anywhere near the levels of Hurricane Sandy, but yet uh, high enough to cause noticeable impacts in your community. Uh, so from this, I've actually taken some um, information from your weather forecast office that gives some description of where impacts tend to occur. Uh, and on this instance, on this particular day, when we know water levels were somewhere between two to three feet above high tide. Pictures uh, say a thousand words. So uh, these are some areas and the depths of floods that occur in more or less a wind driven situation here, not so much localized rain on, on this uh, in particular event. Um, quite noticeable. Uh, it was winter time, obviously that, that puts another layer of, of, <laughs> of cold to it, but nonetheless, it's uh, ocean water that we see here in normally dry uh, communities. So what's changed is the level of the ocean itself. The tides and our atmospheric conditions, the storms themselves, uh, largely have not changed through time. But if I look at the highest water levels in a day over let's say five year snapshots you can see that relative to these thresholds these elevation thresholds the uh more and more impactful now are the typical sort of storms and tides you know the, the rare events that happen the hurricane sandys you know hopefully they don't happen often but they're considered quite rare uh it's hard to diagnose whether or not you know they have a climate change signal to them uh, because they happen so infrequently however the things that tend to happen normally, nor'easters, uh, perigene spring tides, your king tides, those things happen every year, but with the creep of sea level rise, they start to have higher reach, more impacts. So in a distribution sense, meaning uh, this area under the curve would more or less represent 365 highest water levels in a year on average, relative to the zero being a mean high, high water, your average high water datum, for instance, it would be the zero on the sea level rise viewer. Oftentimes, a lot of these mapping tools that sort of uh, the viewer would say what's normally wet versus what's normally dry. Um, you can see through time, rare events, the probability of rare events have increased, but the uh, due to sea level rise, the lesser extremes now are really starting to enter underneath that if the two foot flood might be a trigger, uh, an actual threshold of minor impacts occurring, it's really getting quite close to where there's a very non-linear response on an annual basis. Meaning, uh, if I look at the three foot flood through time, this would be the number of days per year with an exceedance above three feet. I don't really see a pattern yet. They happen maybe every two or three years, maybe a couple in a given year. Uh, they may have exceeded three feet, but I'm using that as a count threshold. But when I look at the two foot threshold and say what's reached two feet or exceeded that, you really start to see this very nonlinear response occurring. As sea level rise continues to elevate typical storm and wind events in your spring tides, 
more and more often they're crossing this threshold and on an annual basis now the uh those exceedances are accelerating so it's not a gradual increase at this point now on a year-to-year -year, uh, gain basis it's a fairly rapid uptick in in increases um i wouldn't say that new york city is alone in this it's uh, not unique unfortunately this is sort of what's occurring along much of the east coast and some of the gulf coast is that minor impacts now are beginning to accelerate in many communities new york city as the discussion is today uh boston ocean city atlantic city uh baltimore annapolis norfolk charleston miami uh you're not in this by yourself but you are being proactive in taking you know this conversation seriously and saying you know now now's the time to plan for the future because it's more or less here sea level rise impacts are occurring now. So with that historical uh, look and in, in perspective, you know, what does the future hold? And so here would be the NOAA sea level rise scenarios that we put out uh, two years ago that uh, two of which the uh, sort of the, not the lowest, but the two second to lowest uh, really sort of form this intermediate low and intermediate are considered the likely uh, rise to occur this century under continued high emissions as well as reduced emissions. So it could be higher. Uh, it's likely not going to be lower. But in terms of typical risk exposure and the types of decisions, this could be one way of framing uh, likely outcomes. Again, if they're critical infrastructure that can't fail very long lived, well then, you know, these uh, higher scenarios are plausible they're less likely, but they necessarily should not be ruled out. So with that in mind, uh, this would be the global scenarios of, of rise uh, projected out to 2200. And with the altimeter uh, observations uh, overlaid on, on the actual scenarios, you can get a sense of the trajectory that we're not too far off the intermediate low right now. Uh, and so this would sort of be that the framing for future under maybe average risk tolerant. When we downscale this for New York City, uh, globally, rise is not uniform, and there's three reasons why New York City, or two primarily, that New York City would be higher than the global would be subsidence. Uh, New York City area is sinking to some extent, um, partially uh, natural reasons, maybe from the end of the last ice age. Um, also, reduction in uh, Gulf Stream, which is projected to occur uh, this century, would exacerbate sea level rise, as well as additional melt of the large ice sheets. Antarctica, in particular, will cause additional sea level rise along the east coast of the United States. Greenland might mitigate some of that, but more or less here would be a manifestation of those likely rise for New York City with these other factors built in. So by the end of the century, under NOAA scenarios, which align closely in the same sort of construct to the, uh, to the New York City uh, scenarios themselves, a lot of the underpinning of similar research, um, somewhere between two and slightly higher than four feet of rise by the end of the century under these scenarios. And you can see that uh, when we look at observations of relative sea level rise made at the battery, um, this is meteorological year, and this is how I diagnose high tide flooding. It could be very similar to calendar year for, for all extent and purposes. Um, more or less, that sort of seems to be binning the trajectory and interannual variability, which does affect flood risk. So, you know, to be determined, but here is a overlay of trajectory that uh, could be somewhat helpful in near term decision making, maybe over the next decade or two, as well as th these tracking tools that we're developing at NOAA are intended to help sort of to determine trigger points. You know, at what point do you? recognize that you need to um, implement the ad adaptive strategies that were built in to allow for change when change needed to occur. You know, in an economic sort of analogy, you know, at what point do you reshuffle your portfolio? You know, you've seen enough, you've observed enough, now's the time for change. Um, a translation of what is the mean, a rise in mean sea level actually uh, uh, suggest in terms of uh, exceedances above these thresholds uh, so that the, the same dots that you saw earlier that were accelerating were those two foot floods in red at the top here shown in a bar graph the three foot which are very hard to distinguish because there's only one or maybe two a year 
uh, on the left axis scale, which would be 365 days per year, you can see it with the continuation of sea level uh, about that likely range, that very nonlinear uh, response becomes quite noticeable. So, you know, what might be occurring, uh, on, let's say, 10 times a year or so, that two foot flood, you know, by 2050 on average, somewhere between 45 and 125 days per year. Uh, so, a uh, very noticeable jumps with that uh, uh, sea level rise of, that's intended, you know, on the likely range. The three foot flood, which occurs less frequently now, probabilistically it's less, uh, it doesn't occur as often. You need more of a storm or localized event to really cause it today. In time, with continued sea level rise, will become more uh, dominated by typical events. Uh, it has a slower response, but by 2050, uh, you know, that's somewhere between 15 and 25 days on average. Uh, could be higher in any given year, but that's sort of binning typically sort of the variability that might occur from year to year uh, under those two sea level rise scenarios themselves. So not uh, trivial by any means, you know, with real consequences for responses uh, that I'm, I'm sure this is what your uh, discussion about is today is with this type of data uh, historically and future projected, you know, how best to situate and recognize change as it is likely to occur so you can be well positioned to defend against it. Um, the last real slide here is another sea uh, level rise viewer, another tool within our NOAA group that uh, shows elevations at or below certain uh, one, two, three, four feet that you can kind of visualize in a bathtub sense, if it is tidally driven, you know, what elevations are at risk of flooding? Um, and here shown is that three foot kind of flood uh, with I think Rachel's Bake Shop, I believe has water up to the door. And these are geo referenced kind of uh, images that are based upon uh, elevation at the ground as to what that would look like in a hypothetical sense. Again, historically, I'm sure these have happened uh, through catalog impact catalogs of past events. Um, but this could give you some sense of uh, areas uh, with elevations that are at risk. So with continued sea level rise, it's essentially an elevation game. Lower elevations are more at risk than higher elevations as would uh, be assumed with the sea level rise. Uh, in closing, here are a few of the reports and products that are freely available on our web that go into more depth. Uh, we, we're starting to provide seasonal out, uh, outlooks for sort of readiness purposes. When does high tide flooding uh, most likely to occur. Uh, we're starting to provide annual outlooks. So uh, as these um, uh, events occur more often and responsive, reactive responses need to occur, you know, the, the proper budgeting of that, uh, as well as uh, longer term scenarios and, and mapping tools to allow, you know, our first order sort of assessments for risk and vulnerability. Um, so with that, uh, that concludes my testimony. I'm, I'm happy to entertain um, any questions? Thank you, Dr. Sweet. Um, what are your recommendations for mitigating uh, the tidal flooding, the sunny day flooding that you were just speaking about here in the New York City area? Uh, that's uh, that's a great question. Um, obviously, it's obviously it's a very localized uh, decision. Um, one thing is for certain with continued sea level rise elevation uh, becomes a very important factor. Uh, if you're not able to elevate um, actual ground level uh, infrastructure, then be cognizant that there will be subsurface emergence going on. Um, I think in terms of long term um, critical infrastructure that's uh, newly planned or are going to be cited to take uh, considerations into where you're actually considering moving it in terms of overall risk and exposure with sea level rise based upon uh, historical uh, exceedance likelihoods of two, three, four feet. Uh, that would make, you know, prudent type decisions based upon historical observation. You know, coming from a, a group with NOAA, you know, we don't actually give sort of recommendations out of how to best uh, make your decisions locally. But one thing is, is we want to make sure that you understand or enable to use our data in a way that uh, that you understand and, and, and you know really assist in smart decision making. So, you know, pay attention to the projections in the past and elevations, and you know, uh, locally that's about uh, you know my suggestion. You know, collectively there is a 
uh, less emissions equals less heating equals less ice melt and thermal expansion of the ocean equals less overall uh, sea level rise and flood risk. So collectively uh, within you know, all the cities and states and countries, there is an alternative future. But with that being not really on the discussion table here, uh, it's probably best to position for a uh, future that's largely uncertain. So don't box yourself into any particular solution, but leave an adaptive capacity to whatever decisions you make today because you may revisit them tomorrow. And I'm looking at your, at your report now, and you're saying by the mid-century, there is a possibility that the two-foot floods, right, the two-foot tidal wave, you know, sort of sunny day tidal flooding could be about a third of the year. Correct. You're talking about between 45 and 125 days where we could be experiencing these types of events. That wakes out to like one in every three days we could be having these type of events in New York City. Is that correct? Is that a fair characterization of your position? Yes, that, that, that is correct. That is a, uh, a potential outcome under likely uh, sea level rise scenarios under continued high emissions. Um, Again, a two-foot flood, I don't think necessarily means two feet over ground in areas, you know, throughout the city. Uh, there's been enough instances of those two-foot flood uh, uh, that have occurred that you could get a pretty good estimate as to where those impacts are now. Those are sort of your hot spots or your wet spots. So those areas that water tends to want to pool and, and come up out of the stormwater systems or over top old seawalls or enter in those communities that just aren't fortunate enough to have larger seawalls or have been elevated through time. Uh, those communities, those assets, yes, very well could be impacted upwards of a third of the year uh, by 2050 on average. And those are communities in our neighborhoods that are usually environmental justice communities, those communities who can ill afford to move, and they're going to be the ones who are going to be one out of every three days impacted. Um, just wanted to make sure I put that back on the record. With that, I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Council Member and Chair Justin Brennan, for any questions he might have to you. Sure. Um, I, guess, I guess sort of very broadly, what, what do you think the city should be doing um, uh, to, to address all of this stuff that we're not currently doing? Well, uh, I think it's important to recognize that the rare events will happen. Uh, they, they happen infrequently, the Hurricane Sandys. Hopefully, New York City doesn't experience another one of those. Uh, but obviously, that's probably not the case moving forward, whether it's in the 10 years or 100 years. And those are the types of events that communities typically become most concerned and, and uh, uh, fear for a good reason. Um, but the lesser extremes uh, may become a little bit more challenging to defend by. I'm not sure. I'm not a structural engineer or hydraulic engineer by trade to recognize how large storm gates and flood barriers uh, will treat daily tides. You know, eventually this becomes a tidal issue and it's best not to be in the tide's way. Uh, holding back the tide where the tide wants to go becomes challenging because it's a frequent event on a you know daily weekly nature that we could be discussing moving forward whether or not those types of defense structures uh will provide that type of protection it's something that really needs to be thought thought about so in terms of what uh would be some prudent planning purposes would again be look at your elevations uh look at the overall frequency or duration or uh, a probability moving forward to say what are your tolerances of various systems or assets or public patients for that matter uh, how often can they stand being wet once a year five times a year 10 times a year 20 times a year uh, and use the NOAA science and services that we provide to as well as supplementing your local academic institutions and, and city groups that are, are you know pretty advanced uh, around the country and, and, and working on this topic but use that information uh, as you are and really think about where uh, you're placing and, and to make sure to move the important things out of harm's way when chances uh, present themselves. Thank you, Chair. Dr. Sweet, I just want to thank, I want to thank you for your testimony today and your insight and all the work that you're doing. And I look forward to continuing our conversation with one another um, as we are going to continue to monitor and, and speak with one another on these issues. Great. Thank you. I enjoyed being in front of your committee today. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor.
Uh, with that, I want to recognize Councilmember Eric Ulrich from Queens, who is joining us here today. Uh, with that, I'll, I will call up the first panel with the, for the mayor's office. Uh, we have uh, Nate Grove, Chief of Waterfront and Marine Operation for New York City Parks. Uh, Janie uh, Babishi, I want to make sure I get it right with a name like Constantinidis. I want to get it right uh, from the mayor's office of Resiliency Recovery. Uh, we have someone from the DOT. Sheila Feinberg from New York City DOT and Michael Deloche from New York City DEP. Could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. Let's uh, look forward to hearing your testimony. Okay, great. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Janie Bavici, May the Mayor's Director for Resiliency. I would like to thank Chairperson Constantinidis, Chairperson Brannon, and the other members of the Environmental Protection and Resiliency and Waterfront Committees for the opportunity to speak today about the de Blasio administration's work to adapt to climate change, which pre presents an existential threat to New York City and the 8.6 million New Yorkers who call the city home. Today we com commemorate the seventh anniversary of Hurricane Sandy, the deadliest and most destructive natural disaster in New York City's history. The storm left 44 New Yorkers dead, upended entire neighborhoods, and cost $19 billion in damages and economic loss. It was a tragedy of an almost unimaginable scale. In the aftermath of Sandy, it was clear that federal assistance would be needed to help New York City recover and rebuild. As a result of appropriations passed in 2013, New York City received approximately $15 billion in federal funding for recovery and resiliency. These funds, along with roughly $5 billion from city capital, have enabled us to initiate dozens of programs and large-scale infrastructure projects to guard against climate threats. This $20 billion is our down payment, an investment to protect the people of New York City from the climate crisis. And while we have made significant progress with these funds, we are also facing a dynamic threat that is growing more menacing with each passing day. Because the climate will continue changing, resiliency must be viewed as a process, not an outcome. In this testimony, I will detail this administration's approach to climate change adaptation, focusing on the ways in which it improves upon the approach of the Bloomberg administration. I will then summarize the progress we have made to build resiliency across the five boroughs. Finally, I will speak to our next phase of planning and the complexities of addressing a cross-cutting and interjurisdictional issue that will continue to evolve for many decades to come. New York City's approach to climate adaptation has its roots in the immediate aftermath of Sandy. In late 2012 and early 2013, the Bloomberg administration worked at a furious pace to generate ideas for potential resiliency projects. The long-term aspiration was to defend against another Sandy-like storm, but a key step along the way would be to convince Congress to allocate the absolute maximum amount of federal recovery funds. In service of both of these goals, the Bloomberg administration convened the Special Initiative on Recovery and Rebuilding and released a stronger, more resilient New York, also known as the SIR report. However, this report was released before the complexity of major projects was fully realized. Engineers and architects had not yet been hired to study individual project areas and communities had not engaged for their feedback. As a result, the timelines that were proposed were aspirational and the projects conceptual in nature. When Mayor de Blasio came into office in 2014, he recommitted to the initiatives proposed in SIR as part of the 2015 1NYC strategy. The vision laid out in 1NYC went beyond the Bloomberg approach in two ways. First, it added an equity and justice lens to our work. And second, it broadened our focus to include all of the threats posed by climate change. The SIR report focused on storm surge because it was a direct response to Hurricane Sandy. Over time, however, it became increasingly clear that that was not enough. We know that extreme heat, for example, kills more New Yorkers than any other extreme weather event, and temperatures keep rising. Meanwhile, we're seeing more rainfall each year, and that rainfall is concentrated in more intense downpours. Finally, we have to contend with the long-term challenge of sea level rise, which could remake our streets into rivers even on sunny days and corrode the foundations of our buildings. As we plan for all of these threats, we must consider several var variables, including technical feasibility, neighborhood character, and quality of life. We have learned that building walls cannot be the only solution. In fact, building massive walls meant to save communities 
can instead isolate and destroy them. Increasingly, cities around the world are grappling with the reality that concrete and steel cannot protect us completely. The standard of keeping every home and every road dry, no matter the condition, is an impossible one. We must take a multi-layered approach, which is why we have strengthened the city's building and zoning codes and implemented significant programs to promote social resiliency, maximize, fl maximize flood insurance enrollment, and educate New Yorkers about risk. Adapting to all of the threats posed by climate change requires action at multiple levels, from the individual household to the entire region. No one entity can do it alone, and there's no silver bullet solution. I would now like to give a brief summary of the progress that has been made and the upcoming milestones that lay ahead. It goes without saying that our progress is the product of a massive team effort directed by the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and implemented by nearly every city agency. We're also in constant coordination with state and federal partners, as well as dozens of community organizations and private and philanthropic partners, all of which are taking discrete actions to increase the city and the region's overall resiliency. Let me mention just a few accomplishments here. We have completed construction on several shorefront projects, including the 5.5 mile long Rockaway Boardwalk, nearly 10 miles of new dunes across Staten Island and the Rockaway Peninsula, and ecological restorations in Sunset Cove in Queens and Sawmill Creek in Staten Island. The Build It Back program administered by our colleagues, colleagues in the Mayor's Office of Housing Recovery Operations has helped 12,500 families recover from Hurricane Sandy. Each and every one of these families will be measurably safer the next time a storm hits. We, along with our partners, have invested more than a billion dollars into hardening and stormproofing the city's infrastructure. We've invested a billi billions of dollars to increase the resiliency of our schools, public housing, and hospitals. And we've invested more than 100 million in grants and loans for small businesses, which are the bedrock of so many communities. We have increased insurance policies among New Yorkers by 59% since 2012 through a public awareness effort. And we've updated the city's emergency protocols, including new evacuation maps and response equipment. We also are continuing to move forward with several complex generational projects which, which require careful planning, extensive community engagement, and several layers of engineering and environmental review before shovels can hit the ground. I am pleased to report that next year, four major groundbreakings will take place across three boroughs. Construction will begin on the Staten Island Coastal Storm Risk Management Project, the Atlantic Side Rockaway Reformulation, the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, and New York State's Living Breakwaters Project in Staten Island. Finally, I would like to illustrate the ways the de Blasio administration is addressing the next generation of climate change threats with two brief examples. To combat extreme heat, we have launched Cool Neighborhoods NYC, a $106 million program designed to keep New Yorkers safe and cool. To combat extreme rainfall and the strain it places on our sewer system, we are doubling the size of New York City's nation-leading green infrastructure program by constructing 5,000 brand new curbside rain gardens. This summary is intended to provide the council with a small sampling of the progress that has been made. My office is available to provide more in-depth information on any of these projects or any of the city's many other resiliency efforts at your request. We have learned many lessons over the past seven years, and we're already beginning to put them to use. Before Hurricane Sandy, the complexities of adapting to climate change were largely theoretical. After the storm, we had very little time to grapple with difficult issues, including land use, governance, prioritization, and an uncertain funding landscape. Our approach focused on addressing the areas hit hardest by Hurricane Sandy and those at greatest risk from climate threats in the future. We moved ahead by advancing construction and implementing programs as soon as federal funds were made available. It quickly became clear that adapting New York City would require coordinating dozens of different entities with different jurisdictions, including the MTA, the Port Authority, the state DEC and DOT, utility providers, and the private property owners along New York City's waterfront. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which plans, designs, and builds dams, canals, and flood protections all across the country, was also a major player and remains so today. In 2013, President Obama directed the, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to study coastal resiliency in the region, and the Corps subsequently began the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries, or HAT study, in 2016. This study had an initial budget of $3 million, which has since been increased to $19.4 million after the complexities of the work became more apparent. This study is incredibly important because it will provide the blueprint for the next round of coastal resiliency projects in New York City. Federal engineers, architects, and designers are doing a detailed analysis of site conditions in dozens of New York City neighborhoods and 25 counties in New York and New Jersey, including elevation analyses, feasibility studies, and environmental impact assessments. 
They're also holding community meetings to solicit feedback periodically throughout their process. At present, the Corps has identified five different potential approaches. Most of these approaches contain constellations of dozens of individual land-based and water-based projects spread across New York City and the region, including the projects that, including projects the city has long advocated for, such as land-based protections for Long Island City and in-water storm surge barriers in Newtown Creek, the Gowanus Canal, and Jamaica Bay, including a Coney Island tie-off. Next summer, the Corps will select the best approach and publicly announce their choice. At that point, we will have a new set of urgently needed projects to work toward. We will also need to find funding for these projects, which does not currently exist. One of the bills being considered today, Introduction 1620, would direct the city to develop a resiliency plan for New York City's coastal areas. We fully support the goals of this legislation and share the council's interest in protecting our shoreline. However, we are concerned that advancing a city plan in parallel with the federal plan could create confusion, waste taxpayer resources, and result in additional proposed projects that have no clear funding source. Re-envisioning all of New York City's 520 miles of shoreline is a massive endeavor. We have three times more waterfront than the entire country of the Netherlands, and it's far more densely populated by residential and industrial uses. As we have learned from Hurricane Sandy, resiliency planning needs a strong foundation of community engagement and input. 38 out of the city's 59 community districts are coastal. Simultaneously engaging these communities on all the resiliency tools outlined in this bill, including largely untested approaches like strategic relocation, would be akin to conducting dozens of rezoning simultaneously. This effort would be completely unprecedented in New York City's history. We believe the best strategy for future resiliency planning is to continue advocating for the Army Corps to finish their study as quickly as possible. At the same time, we will continue our efforts to address the full slate of other climate threats. We're making important progress on that front. The city continues to work with local and regional governmental bodies to assist in identifying the region's at-risk infrastructure and the best ways to protect it. We're conducting a stormwater study to identify where precipitation-based flooding occurs most frequently and how to address it. We also monitored air temperature in 14 neighborhoods throughout New York City over the last two summers to address the drivers of high temperatures in the city. The results of these efforts will continue to guide our response to climate change and help prioritize how we advance future projects. Unfortunately, unlike many European countries, the United States does not have a proactive federal funding strategy for climate change adaptation. Here, money flows only after a disaster, which creates significant challenges for long-term planning and implementation. I would now like to discuss the two other bills being heard today. Introduction 382 would require the Office of Emergency Management to provide all property owners in the floodplain with information related to FEMA's new flood maps after they go into effect. The administration supports the intent of this bill. However, since FEMA administers the creation of these maps and sets the rates for flood insurance nationwide, we believe they should issue these notifications. The Mayor's Office of Resiliency will formally request this of FEMA, along with the rec recommendation that any such notifications be issued before the maps go into effect, to give New Yorkers time to prepare. We also ask that count the Council consider complementing FEMA notifications with a city-sponsored notification through Department of Finance mailings. Such a notification could explain FEMA's authority and direct re recipients to FloodHelpNY.org, a user-friendly New York, New York City-specific flood risk and flood education site. Introduction 1480 would create a Marine Debris Disposal Office. The administration supports the intent of the bill and looks forward to discussing with Council the ways we can partner in cleaning up our waterways. To provide context, the city is the single largest owner of shoreline, handling much of the debris that is not removed by the Army Corps or private property owners. In the wake of Hurricane Sandy, our marine, mar, our marine debris removal contract maintained by DCAS, along with FEMA and NOAA grants, allowed the city to complete millions of dollars worth of cleanup citywide. To conclude my testimony, I would like to thank both committees for the opportunity to discuss the city's progress toward climate resiliency and the challenges that still lie ahead of us. We look forward to your questions. Thank you. All right. Um so if I'm reading your testimony correctly, your plan is to allow Donald Trump and his Army Corps of Engineers to issue a plan. We go along with that. We do no other legislation, and we just trust everybody this is going to go along fine. We're implementing $20 billion worth of resiliency projects citywide already that are focused on the, mo the most at-risk neighborhoods. The Army Corps of Engineers is doing a science-based technical analysis 
of the next round of coastal resiliency projects. This is an incredibly complex interjurisdictional issue that requires assistance from the Army Corps to bring together uh, not only the city but with, but with other uh, state and uh, federal agencies. Um, this is, this is a, a, a process that has uh, been really devoid of politics, actually. Um, it is a science-based technical feasibility study, and we're at the table with the Army Corps uh, reviewing what, what is coming out of this study. And, and the Army Corps was here before us, and, and we still have very deep concerns about them not taking sea level rise into account. But let me, let me, let me say this again. Um, let me rephrase. This is the problem I have with the administration on a consistent basis. Instead of coming here with constructive tests, uh, of feedback on how we can improve legislation, there is a consistent sort of rejection of every piece of legislation. And the things you mentioned here, uh, the precipitation, base flooding, uh, you're conducting that storm, that was a council bill, right? That was something that we asked and at the time that we proposed the bill, you, the administration told us we didn't need that. But we passed it anyway, and now you're touting that that's something that you're doing because this council worked with the administration to get that done. Uh, we talked about the air quality. Those are things, again, that were part of a council bill. At the time that they were heard, we were told that it was not necessary. And then we worked in collaboration to pass that legislation, and now it's part of something that you're touting that you're doing. The, the frustration that I have here that I shouldn't have today, and it's unnecessary, is the complete lack of this administration's recognition that there is a co-equal branch of government that has put forth ideas that wants to work with you guys and come up with solutions. And instead of giving us feedback on how we can make the legislation better, you consistently and persistently you know, reject these ideas offhand, say how much you want to work with us, and then we will go to pass the bills, you tout them as if they were your idea. So I, I'm, I'm, it's a frustration on my part just on process, that we keep ending up, we start in the same dance with one another. I wish we would start from a different place of, here are the things we can actually do to improve this legislation, let's do that together, instead of saying how much you want to work with me. I want to work with you too. <laughs> I do, and you know that. But I'm frustrated with this consistent testimony from the administration that doesn't change. Uh, we certainly appreciate the council's partnership and leadership. Um, uh, the, the, the legislation that is being heard today, um, Introduction 1620, acknowledges the Army Corps study as an important mechanism that, uh, that is advancing coastal resiliency planning that needs to be coordinated with. We're just acknowledging that that um, study uh, uh, is, is underway um, and it will not reach its next uh, major milestone until, until the summer of 2020, at which point we will know which set of land-based and in-water projects uh, the Army Corps is moving forward with. That's a really important input into coastal resiliency planning for the city. So that's simply what I'm uh, highlighting here today. Is the city ready for our next superstorm? If we got hit tomorrow, would we be ready? Uh, absolutely. Uh, New York City is definitively safer and better protected than it was uh, during Hurricane Sandy seven years ago. We've um, said, as I said in my testimony, that we've completed several coastal protection projects, including the reconstructed Rockaway Boardwalk, which is now meant to serve as coastal protection for the community, and have built nearly 10 miles of dunes across Staten Island and the Rockaway Peninsula. We've increased flood insurance among New Yorkers by 59% since 2012, boosting financial resiliency. Uh, we've hardened and storm-proofed critical infrastructure to minimize disruptions to critical services during an extreme weather event. Um, over 12,500 families have been served through the Build It Back program, making them safer and more ready for another storm. And we're breaking ground on four major coastal protection projects across three boroughs next year. The Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, the Atlantic side of the Rockaway Reformulation, the South Shore Staten Island Levee, and the New York State's Living Breakwaters Project. Um, there's absolutely more work to do, but we are definitively safer than we were seven years ago. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're completely ready. Um, so I have a question about, I mean, how do we look at our plan, right? How, is there any connectivity to what we're doing? I know we're spending a lot of money, I know we're doing lots of things, which is wonderful. And, and I acknowledge the work that we've done, absolutely. Um, but is there a connectivity to what we're doing? Um, you know, are we thinking about things in, in connection to one another with all five boroughs? Uh, we talk about you know, the big U in lower Manhattan. 
Like we, are we looking at how the plans that we're doing in, in the Rockaways are connected to what's going on in Brooklyn, that's going on to Manhattan? Like what are we doing to connect all of these ideas that it's comprehensive, that it's not just we're doing this here, we're doing this here, we're doing this here. Wouldn't having a, a, a plan with connectivity and sort of more of a holistic plan be more beneficial in the long run because uh, these, these projects would feed off one another in combating both sea level rise and storm surge? Thank you for the question. We, we've learned through our uh, efforts since Hurricane Sandy that every neighborhood is different and every neighborhood requires a unique adaptation solution. Um, technical feasibility, neighborhood character, and quality of life are all important considerations as we advance coastal uh, resiliency solutions. Um, and we've um, absolutely prioritized uh, the outer boroughs in our resiliency planning. Um, we are implementing the, uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers the Rockaway reformulation work um, in, in the Rockaways, uh, the Staten Island levy. Um, we uh, have invested um, uh, uh, over $2 billion into um, protections in uh, Coney Island that are not just shore-based but also building-based, um, are advancing an integrated flood protection um, system in Red Hook. Um, and we're um, also uh, advancing a Hunts Point food market resiliency project in the Bronx. I, I hear you on the different things that we're doing. And again, there's, I'm just asking, what, would it, is there value in having connectivity and thinking of every neighborhood is different, but we're all connected to one another, right? Like we're, we're one city. So is there, is there value in us thinking about these things in a connective way, right? How these communities how the, the planning in one community impacts the community right next door. We absolutely look at um, what impacts a project in one community might have on another. So for example, um, there has been a question about water displacement. Do any of our projects uh, displace a storm surge and create uh, residual flooding in other communities? Um, those are impacts that we evaluate and we would not move forward if, um, if there were uh, uh, impacts that we could not mitigate. Um, so all of the shore-based protections that we are advancing across the entire city um, uh, do not uh, uh, have that impact. And then f you know, looking at our like critical infrastructure, like wastewater treatment plants, which I know there's one of them in our dis in my district, and um, you know during Hurricane Sandy, hun you know, hundreds of millions of gallons of sewage spilled into our waterways. Um, how are we hardening our infrastructure for our wastewater treatment plants and sort of? Beyond that, right, we know this, you know, there is this, you know, it's going to rain even more. We have this precipitation study. Uh, you know, five billion gallons of sewage alone went into Flushing Bay, Flushing Creek last year. So what are we doing around our critical infrastructure, around our waterways to, one, you know, make sure that infrastructure is, is in good repair and in good place? Two, like, how are we improving our sewer systems that we're, you know, we're not to see more CSOs, not to see more runoff into our water bodies, which are only gonna make quality of life in New York City worse. Uh, I'm gonna uh, start responding to this question and then defer to my colleague from DEP. Um, we are absolutely taking um, a, a proactive approach in hardening our wastewater treatment plants um, and stormproofing our wastewater treatment plants. Um, and in fact, DEP has been incredibly progressive about this and have started using our climate resiliency design guidelines, which take our future projections for a range of climate hazards and provide guidance to designers and engineers about how to incorporate those hazards into the design and construction of capital projects. Uh, but I will um, defer to my colleague, Michael Deloach, to uh, add any other information. Can we just get um, the DEP folks, the parks folks, and the, um, who's the other person that's here from the mayor? Just have you all get sworn in at once so I'm not swearing people in in, in intermediate stages, please. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. So we are firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today. So in terms of um, protecting our 14 wastewater resource recovery facilities, we currently are uh, managing $400 million worth of projects um, to better safeguard the, the vital equi equipment, um, whether that's elevating, uh, elevating the equipment, flood proofing the equipment, installing flood barriers, sealing buildings. There's um, extensive work going on to make sure. We did a review after Sandy of all of our facilities to see, identify what the uh, 
uh, what the needs were, and we're happy to say we're working on those. Mo majority should be complete by next year. And by next year. And how about the issues around additional rain going into our – I mean, last year was a – more than average rain year, and that's going to become more of the norm. What are we doing around additional CSOs and sort of mitigating those? Sure. So um, in the past 10 years, we've spent uh, $3.6 billion to update and expand our, our, our vital infrastructure. We've um, created 10,000 acres of blue belts. We have um, spent an unprecedented $2 billion in southeast Queens to add new infrastructure and sewers. Um, we're constructing new high-level storm sewers that capture the, the additional storm water and take it out of our sewer system. Um, there is a ton of work going on across the city to continue to update and expand the capacity of our system. And what are we? In, uh, what sort of anticipation are we having on? I, you know, what, let me. There's a lot of questions that need to be. I'm going to come back to you, Mike, on my okay. second round. Okay. Um, lastly, I just want to. I'm going to pass, I don't want to monopolize this hearing, but I do want to ask, uh, how are we balancing the need for resiliency measures and sustainability measures, right? Because and there's only a certain amount of roof space. We have to move critical infrastructure to the roof for resiliency measures, but at the same token, we need to make sure we're doing things like green roofs and solar panels on the sustainability side. So how are we making that balance, making those choices uh, to ensure that we're making buildings both resilient and sustainable in the long run, that we're reducing emissions by doing solar and green roofs, but also bringing critical infrastructure you know, out of the basements and into places where they won't flood. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. This is such an important point. Uh, we coordinate very closely with our mayor's office of uh, sustainability, which is our sister office, to make sure that we're not only adapting to the impacts of climate change that are locked in and that we cannot avoid, but also mitigating um, uh, our carbon footprint. Um, you know, I think there are some uh, innovative uh, solutions in this regard. For example, our cool roofs program is a great example of how we are uh, coating rooftops with a special white reflective uh, uh, paint to um, uh, r uh, keep neighborhood, keep buildings and neighborhoods cool um, in the face of extreme heat, but also lower our energy use um, so that uh, we are um, mitigating our, our carbon impact from these buildings during extremely hot days. Um, I think that we absolutely need to continue to look for more solutions like this um, that can both serve adaptation and, uh, sus and sustainability purposes. And are we getting together with agencies on a consistent basis to make sure that both of these ideas are being thought about whenever we're constructing a new, you know, new school, a new library, a new, you know, why are we making sure that these and I know there are guidelines, right, but they're guidelines, which means they're not mandatory. So how do we bring, make sure that these types of ideas are being brought into every construction project that we have in the city of New York? Uh, we uh, released the, the third version of our guidelines earlier this year, and agencies are already starting to use them. Um, and uh, I think that's great progress, um, and we need to continue moving down that line so that um, uh, we start building a culture of resiliency and a, and a practice of incorporating these uh, projections um, into the design and, and construction of our, of our buildings and infrastructure projects, as well as incorporating sustainability goals. And the last thing I'll say is, is what if we're not happy with the Army Corps plan? Right? What if it's a plan that, that creates water displacement? What if there's a plan that we're not comfortable with as the city of New York? I know we're at the table. I know they're, they're, they're doing good work. But what, are we not, what if we are unhappy with that plan? Where does that leave us in, in us not developing our own plan? Uh, well, I think that we will push the Army Corps to develop a plan that we are happy with, and um, that is why we're at the table um, and uh, uh, reviewing uh, interim milestones along the way. Um, it's, it's premature to um, uh, anticipate where, where they'll um, lead, but um, we are uh, very closely monitoring their progress. All right, I'm going to come back for a second round, but I'll, I'll pass it at this time to uh, Chair Brennan for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I want to acknowledge uh, we've been joined by Council Members Traeger, Levin, and Richards. Um, oh, and, and Councilman Roth. Oh, sorry, let's see you. Thank you. And Councilman Espinal was here as well. Um, you know, I don't think that, I don't think any members of this committee, certainly not the Chair and I, take any satisfaction in um, 
when we asked the question if the city is prepared if Sandy were to hit again today like it did seven years ago, I don't think we take any satisfaction in knowing that we're right um, in that we don't think the city is ready. Um, you know, I, I don't think we take any pleasure in that. Um, but th there's certain things that, what I'd like to know is aside, I hear a lot about studies and sandbags. Um, I'd like to know what, what has, I'm not talking about shovels in the ground next year. I'm talking about as we stand today, October 29, 2019, what projects have been completed, finished? Um, we've completed several coastal projects, including the reconstructed Rockaway Boardwalk. We've installed 10 miles of new dunes across Staten Island and the Rockaway Peninsula. Uh, we have completed a, um, uh, a tea groin and sand nourishment project in Seagate in Brooklyn. Um, we are, uh, we've worked with the Army Corps to re-nourish the area between Beach 92nd and Beach 103rd Street. Um, we have restored Sunset Cove and Broad Channel. Um, this is an ecological restoration project to uh, mitigate uh, floodwaters and improve the health of Jamaica Bay. We restored 54 acres of uh, wetlands in uh, the west shore of Staten Island, and we have uh, installed uh, temporary flood protection barriers um, through the Interim Flood Protection Measures Program at 50 plus sites across the city. Um, and this does not include, of course, the great work that the Housing Recovery, um, that the uh, Office of Housing Recovery Operations has done to assert 12,500 families to the Build It Back program. The Rockaway Beach Dune project is finished? I thought it was set to begin the end of this year. Um, there are uh, a couple rounds of Rockaway Dune projects. So um, there, we have installed 5.5 miles of, um, uh, uh, we've installed 10 miles of dunes across Rockaway and Staten Island um, just after Sandy. We, we put more sand on the beach earlier this year. Um, and then there um, will be even more sand going on the beach um, when the Army Corps advances the Rockaway Reformulation Project, which is set to start next year. Um, it's something like the, um, the um, like we took a tour of the Atlantic Basin on Red Hook and, and we saw you know, some of the stuff that's been done. Um, but, but something like HESCO barriers and these super, super temporary protective measures, why, why do they take so long? Uh, the HESCO barriers, the Interim Flood Protection Measures Program was actually um, a program uh, that uh, was funded uh, several years after Sandy. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact year in front of me. Um, it was uh, funded with uh, uh, city expense dollars, and um, it uh, was meant for uh, facilities. It was meant for cr critical infrastructure and facilities. Um, and as we advanced the work in Red Hook, we realized how complicated a permanent flood protection system was going to be, and it took a bit longer to figure out what the exact solution would look like than, than we originally envisioned um, because of technical feasibility and making sure that we weren't destroying the character of the neighborhood. It's a neighborhood with a working waterfront, and we simply didn't want to build 15-foot uh, you know, uh, walls around three sides of the community, which is what it would have taken to protect the community from a 100-year storm. So we were working with the community to figure out a solution that works in that particular neighborhood. Um, and as we were doing that, we realized that we had this other tool that could provide some protection immediately. Um, and we wanted to, to deploy that protection. Um, that in itself required some feasibility analysis, but emergency management moved very, very quickly um, in order to uh, provide that protection in the hurricane season of 2017, before oh. the hurricane season. Why do you think so many projects are still in the study phase? These are extremely complex generational projects. Um, the, uh, and I would say, I would actually um, uh, say that th there, while there are many projects in the study phase, there are actually many, many projects that are much further along than the study phase. They're in design, and many of them are in the final stages of design and are moving toward construction. But do, I mean, do you think the city is moving as fast as, as, the, as the city can move? I think the city is moving with the utmost urgency. Um, what is the city doing to address flooding issues like in, in, in low-lying areas of the city? What types of green infrastructure techniques are being used aside from the rain gardens? Um, you know, how long do these things typically take to be installed? Um, so I just like when we were, so I'm sorry, when we were in Red Hook, we were, we were taking a look at the HESCO barriers and stuff, and then 
but the street basically that we were on, you know, residents were saying that it floods after a regular rainstorm and that we're not doing anything about that. Uh, so, so we are doing something about that, but before I address that, let me just um, uh, differentiate the two types of flooding you're talking about. So the interim flood protection bar barriers, like the HESCO barriers or Tiger Dams, um, they are meant to protect from coastal flooding, so the flooding that comes from over our coastal edge, um, uh, from, from the East River, from the Atlantic Ocean, um, uh, et cetera. Um, the uh, flooding that um, you're talking about, that's precipitation-based flooding, is obviously rain flooding that comes from the sky, right? So we have to just, I, it's important to make sure that we're thinking about where the flooding com comes from because um, it requires two different kinds of solutions to protect our communities from these various different kinds of flooding. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, addressing precipitation-based flooding, DEP actually just announced that they're doubling the size of a nation-leading green infrastructure program. So this is a program that will create curbside rain gardens, um, 5,000 curbside rain gardens in Brooklyn, um, in Queens, and in the Bronx. Um, and we're um, actively working with uh, coastal communities to uh, install other kinds of uh, uh, flood risk reduction measures. So for example, the Rockaway reformulation um, that, that we've been talking about, on the bay side of the Rockaways, we're actually going to be working with the Army Corps to construct high risk uh, flood, uh, sorry, high frequency flood risk reduction measures. So these are the kinds of the me measures you uh, talked about in your opening remarks to protect against the more uh, frequent but um, lower level storms. Um. The work on the dunes, was that, was that work part of regular dune replenishment, or was that specifically post-Sandy? Um, I believe that was a post-Sandy investment from the Army Corps of Engineers to replenish the dunes. Okay. Um, and could you talk a little bit about the, the challenges we face due to climate change that sort of intersect with other challenges faced by um, low-income communities and communities of color, you know, affordable housing, uh, you know, sea level rise, urban heat. Um, ha has the city analyzed the cross-section of these issues to really understand these risks as, you know, nothing happens in the silo? Uh, absolutely. A great example of this is our uh, heat vulnerability index. So when we um, we're working to figure out which neighborhoods in the city are most vulnerable to the impacts of extreme heat. We took the physical indicators of risk into account. These are things like density and limited vegetation and um, the presence of dark impervious surfaces. But we also took the social indicators of risk into account. So we know that um, uh, the oldest residents of our communities, those who are chronically ill or disabled, um, those who have poor housing quality or those who live in poverty are more vulnerable to the risks of extreme heat. Um, so we took all of those factors into account, created a heat vulnerability index, and now we're using that index to actually prioritize where we make investments uh, to protect neighborhoods from extreme heat. And so our, uh, uh, na the neighborhoods that we're prioritizing are the South Bronx, Northern Manhattan, and Central Brooklyn. Um, what, I guess, the, the cool roofs that we saw at, at Red Hook Houses, other than that, what, what other investments are being made? Uh, we are, uh, so about the cool roofs program, just very quickly, uh, because it's a great program. We've coded 10 million square feet of rooftops all across the city, and we are now focusing our roof coatings in the most heat vulnerable neighborhoods, and have a target of putting 1 million square feet of rooftops um, every year for the next 10 years. Um, we are also investing in uh, planting street trees um, in the most heat vulnerable neighborhoods because we know that vegetation is a really important driver um, in, in bringing down ambient temperatures. Um, we're also investing in programs to improve social cohesion. This is based on the basic tenet of neighbors helping neighbors, but there's a lot of research that shows that communities with uh, greater connectivity in their neighborhoods, gr greater social cohesion, are more likely to uh, fare better um, in an extreme heat, uh, heat, heat wave. Um, so we have launched a program called Be A Buddy that uh, connects uh, vulnerable residents with volunteers so that they can build relationships um, when there's not a heat wave, um, but then activate those relationships during heat waves. Um, heat is often known as a silent killer. It, it, it mostly impacts uh, vulnerable residents inside their homes. So we want to make sure that these volunteers are checking on people inside their homes because they either uh, do not leave their home to 
go to a cool space, even though it's getting dangerously hot, or cannot. Um, similarly, we've trained home health aides on detecting early signs of heat illness, so when they're making their rounds um, and seeing their patients, they can help either facilitate access to cool space or detect uh, signs of dehydration, heat st stroke, or heat exhaustion. Um, which borough do you think is the most vulnerable right now? Um, I think that we are uh, actively working to build a resiliency of all five boroughs. Mm -hmm. See, I mean, you think you think Staten Island is as fortified as Lower Manhattan? I think there are major projects that are going to be, uh, uh, be going into construction in both Staten Island and in Lower Manhattan. At the same time, we have done a lot of work citywide to harden critical infrastructure, to uh, increase flood insurance enrollment, to improve social cohesion, um, and to Im improve emergency evacuation and response plans so that citywide we're prepared for another disaster. Yeah. I mean, it sounds great. I just don't, I don't know that anybody in the outer boroughs really believe it. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's just based on the summer that we had, you know, I mean, one or two days of biblical rain and we get flashbacks to seven years ago and that's why we don't feel that we're ready. I mean, and again, it's, I, I take no joy in, in knowing that I'm right. Um, it's just a real concern. I am the first to acknowledge that there is a lot more work to do. Uh, Chairperson Constantinidis mentioned that there is a triple threat that we are facing. I would say that it's more than a triple threat. We are facing the impacts of coastal storms, sea level rise, which leads to tidal flooding, sunny day flooding, and groundwater table rise, extreme heat, and extreme precipitation. And we are actively working to address the city's preparedness on all of those fronts. Yeah, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't wish your job on my worst enemy. It's not easy. Um, it's not easy, and um, but I don't know that I don't know that we should be taking victory laps about breaking ground on projects, you know, eight years after Hurricane Sandy. Um, and I, I don't know who you're going to find to take a victory lap on that. Um, if an, if Sandy happened again tomorrow, do you think the city would create another Build It Back program? I am not the right person to answer that question. Um, I think uh, I will. I I <laughs> um, the mayor has repeatedly said that we would not create another build it back program. Good. Um, uh, uh, one more, and then I want to hand it over to some of my coastal colleagues. Um, there was a, a report, uh, I believe something to the controller's office, that the city has only spent about 54% of nearly 15 billion uh, in federal Sandy funding. Um, and according to OMV, this funding first became available back in May 2013, which is about seven months after Sandy hit. Um, what, what's taken so long to spend that money? Um, so actually much of the money, the federal money was not made available to the city until 2015. Um, and we are spending uh, the money at a, a faster rate than the national average. Um, so, you know, the, again, these are incredibly complex projects, and we are working with a great deal of urgency to implement these projects as quickly as possible. All right, so I have here, and this, this is from a call we did with OMB. Uh, May 2013, the city gets access to its first allocation. Um, September 2013, the city signs an agreement with HUD, start drawing down money for eligible expenses. September 2014, the city receives its second allocation of money. But you're saying you didn't get the money until 2015. Um, I'm saying that the majority of that money didn't come until 2015. Um, I'm happy to uh, talk with you just to make sure that we can, um, I'm happy to follow up with your office just so we, we can uh, make sure that we are working from the same data and um, we can bring OMB into that. Yeah, again, this is from a call we did with OMB. I mean, they're telling us 23rd, January 2013, the city was allocated $4.4 billion and three different grants of money. By April 2015, you had... Yeah, al allocated doesn't necessarily mean that it was available to us, so I, I think we just need to um, uh, check in on those details. Okay, May 2013, OMB says you had access 
the first allocation. Okay. Um, it was in the checking account. Okay. Um, the the uh, my colleague just reminded me that what you're talking about is the HUD dollars, but the the the, the FEMA dollars took a much longer time um, for us to be able to access. Um, and I, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of um, FEMA money that was that makes up that 15 billion. Um, that uh, we have 10 of the 15 billion comes from FEMA. But the, the FEMA money comes is based on individual projects, right? It's not um, some programs are. Um, it, there are different FEMA grant streams, and they work differently. Um, like I said, uh, we're happy to follow up with your office and uh, go through all those details. Okay. Um, and I, do you do you expect the HUD funding will be spent before it expires, the end of 2022? Uh, we expect that we can meet the federal spending deadline. Okay. All right. I'm going to turn it back to Chair Constantinidis and, and let my colleagues have some time. All right. Um, quickly, um, the city created a citywide mapping of wetlands across all five boroughs via Natural Areas Conservancy and New York City Parks. Uh, how, do you, how do you plan to incorporate the use of natural resources such as wetlands and how, that, how does the migration of wetlands due to sea level rise figure into our resiliency planning? Because, I mean, I'll speak from experience. We've been, yeah, the ferry in, in Western Queens got put in very quickly. Um, the resiliency, the you know, sort of the cleanup of the wetlands and the, uh, the, the environmental dock that was supposed to be placed are now in like year five. So, I mean, what are we doing to sort of make sure that we're doing wetland restoration on a more quick basis here? I appreciate the question. Um, I, I uh, had the um, great pleasure of uh, actually being at a ribbon cutting um, earlier uh, uh, a couple months ago to, uh, in Broad Channel to uh, celebrate the completion of the Sunset Cove West Wetland Restoration Project. This is a project that's going to um, restore the ecological health of that area, um, serve as a, a, a uh, as a buffer from uh, wave action, um, and also serve as a, an important ecological education site for uh, students across the city. Um, you know, we are working very closely with the Parks Department to explore other projects like this that can um, uh, serve that, that purpose of restoring ecological health while also providing flood protection. Another example, actually, right off the top of my head, is Sawmill Creek in Staten Island, where we've um, recently completed ecological restoration there. But, I mean, how are we, I mean, I, you heard, I heard you also talk about trees, but I know that right now we have an issue with trees being planted in the city of New York based on price. So. At, this, at the same juncture where you're touting that we're planting more trees, um, we're not, right? We're actually at a, one of our lower points for tree planting in, in, in a long time. So, you know, there's a little bit of a disconnect there from what you were touting to, like, the reality on the ground where we're not getting trees planted as quickly as we need to be based on pricing factors and other issues. You know, I met with the commissioner about this. Um, so, like, how are, you know, where's the disconnect there that we're doing? We're doing you know, a few projects you talked about, like, what's our sort of overall plan for restoration of wetlands, for planting trees when we're actually struggling and doing so? Like, how are we going to get sort of our green infrastructure up? Because you talked about that in your testimony as well, but by when, right? What is our timeline to be doing many of these, um, d you know, different projects? Um, I can't... Uh speak to the overall um, uh, tree plantings in the city, um, I'd be happy to follow up with you and your office um, to have that conversation. Well, parts um, one from Parks is here, aren't they? We, we will come back to you um, with the, uh, the right representatives from the Parks Department to have the conversation about trees and wetlands. Um, what I can say is that these are important tools in the resiliency toolbox. and. Um, as for tree plantings, the tree plantings I mentioned um, earlier in response to the question about extreme heat, um, we're, we, those tree plantings are happening and they're being prioritized in the most heat vulnerable neighborhoods. Um, and and uh, that, that's an important resiliency. But we're measure. planting much less trees. So there, how many trees are actually going in in those communities that they actually need it? I mean, that, right. anyway. I mean, what I can't speak to is the, um, the relationship between the trees we're planting in the most heat vulnerable neighborhoods and the overall tree plantings in the city. That's um, a question for the Parks Department, and we'll, we'll come back to you on right, that. Great. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to first Councilmember Ulrich. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, both chairs, actually. Thank you for uh, having this joint oversight hearing. A uh, very important topic. I represent the Rockaways along with my good friend and colleague, uh, Councilmember Richards. Uh, our respective communities, as you know, uh, Commissioner, were absolutely devastated by Hurricane Sandy. 
and uh, so many homeowners and businesses are still struggling to recover and, uh, and are waiting to be made whole again. I have a question uh, with respect to two of the bills that, the, uh, that we have the hearing on today. The first is mine, intro number 382. Uh, you said that the administration um, supports the intent of the bill, but that basically you want the federal government to pay for any type of notification or mailing. Is that, is that a correct summarization of the administration's position? Uh, no, we suggested that FEMA issue the first notification just because FEMA issues the maps and sets the flood insurance rates. They're, they're responsible for that, and so we believe that it's appropriate for the first notification to come from FEMA. But what we also suggested is that we consider a complimentary notification from the Department of Finance um, in their regular mailings to, to property owners. So you're suggesting on the January uh, notice of property value, for instance, just to use an example, that that could also be used to put uh, a flyer or some sort of brochure or something? Is that, is that what you're suggesting? Is it better use of uh, the city's resources? Uh, exactly. Some, something along those lines that would be possible. Okay. Um, you know, there are so many people who are not currently in the flood zone that will be placed in a flood zone, and they're in for a very, very rude awakening uh, when they find out that if they don't buy flood insurance that they can lose their mortgage, and many people have to pay their mortgages to stay in their homes. So this is a, an additional financial burden on homeowners in coastal communities, not only in the Rockaways and in Queens, but also in Brooklyn and Staten Island in particular, uh, where people are already struggling uh, to afford to stay in their own homes. Uh, so I think that the city really needs to be a lot more proactive with respect to reaching out to affected homeowners, especially those who are not currently in a flood zone, but who will be placed in a flood zone when the final uh, flood, insur flood insurance rate maps are adopted. By the way, on that note, what, do we have a, a, an, an updated timeline? And I know that the city also was in the process of negotiating uh, the firm maps with FEMA, we were going back and forth. What is the anticipated timeline for the public review process? When do you think that that will actually start? Um, I, I wouldn't frame it as a negotiation. We appealed the maps that came out after Sandy based on a, a scientific error. Um, FEMA agreed that that error existed and is doing the modeling again to issue uh, new and accurate flood maps. Um, FEMA is in that process. We expect uh, preliminary uh, flood insurance rate maps to be released in 2022 and be finalized in 2024. Um, but absolutely to your point about the concern of affordability of flood insurance, um, we, uh, one of the uh, suggestions that we're making about um, the, the legislation is that these notifications go out before the flood maps go into effect so that homeowners can prepare for any changes in flood insurance rates. And um, uh, also, I should add that the, uh, the city is um, absolutely advocating for affordability of flood insurance rates um, in Washington. We are actually one of the leading voices um, pushing Congress to really engage in real flood insurance reform um, and, and to in including pushing them to uh, come up with a, a means-tested voucher, meaning that we base flood insurance rates on people's ability to pay. Um, we're, this is absolutely coming from a concern about flood insurance affordability. I mean, this is a real concern for uh, not only my constituents, but again, people in southern Brooklyn and, and parts of Staten Island. Um, they will be in for a rude awakening. Congress has basically kicked the can down the road by just hitting the pause button, button or delaying uh, the full implementation of the Biggert's Waters Act, and, and that is really just kicking the can down the road. I don't think that we can, as a city, responsibly rely on the federal government to do the right thing in the year 2022 or 2024, depending on when the, the maps are finally adopted, um, because it, depending on who's in Washington at the time, uh, that will uh, determine whether or not they are fair uh, to New Yorkers and to other people who are going to be affected by the fact that they're going to find themselves in a flood zone. And if we don't do our due diligence and put our money where our mouth is, quite frankly, um, I think we're doing a disservice to New Yorkers who, uh, who are going to be uh, definitely affected by this, so many of whom do have mortgages and they, they will be mandated and required by law uh, to buy flood insurance. The, the cost of flood insurance, by the way, uh, in my district, since Hurricane Sandy, despite initial attempts to stabilize those costs, it's skyrocketing, especially for commercial property owners. Um, small businesses in particular in Broad Channel, in the Rockways, in Howard Beach, 
um, they have seen their rents increased as a result of the fact that the flood insurance rates have skyrocketed over the past couple of years. So the protections that are in place for homeowners and residential property owners are not necessarily applied to commercial property owners, and that is going to have a devastating impact on small businesses in coastal communities in the flood zones and also in the future flood zones. And so I would like to, sit, I would like to put that on the city's radar. I know that the administration is aware of this, but I just think that we have to do more to prepare for it. We can't just say, oh, we'll worry about it in 2024 when the, when the, when the, when the, when the maps are adopted. We won't be here. Mayor de Blasio will be term limited. We will, most of us, be term limited. And I think it's really unfair for us not to do our due diligence. We're absolutely doing our due diligence. Um, and let me assure you, we're not waiting until new maps come out. We have uh, launched a uh, massive uh, consumer education campaign on flood insurance called Flood Help NY, which I know you're aware of. Um, it uh, offers flood insurance counseling as well as um, uh, resiliency audits. Um, to, to property owners so that we can provide gu guidance on how to potentially reduce premiums but also just make your home safer. Um, and we are also at the table with FEMA um, making sure that we're doing independent technical analysis of the maps as they uh, uh, do their modeling so that um, we're in a place where we have clear maps um, at, at the end of this uh, current study. That they're, that they're Lastly, Commissioner, and I, I want to turn it back over to the chairs. I know my colleagues have other questions. Uh, with respect to the Build It Back program, you know, it's been a, a sticking in my craw for a number of years, and uh, to put it mildly, um, I would just like to know, as of today, seven years after Hurricane Sandy, all of the CDBG funding that we've gotten, how many homeowners are still not back in their homes as of today? Um, I'll defer to my colleague from HRO to answer that question. Yes. You could swear in Mr. Giuliani. I used to swear at Mr. Giuliani when he was my chief of staff. So okay. <laughs> um, he's now the director of the Build It Back uh, program for Queens. But uh, he's he's heard it many times. So go ahead. Uh, there's about uh, 63 homes left in construction. And Six, most, 63. Yeah, most of those are very complicated projects, including 40 in. Uh, Chief said Bay, Brooklyn, where we did all the court systems with the new infrastructure and utilities. Okay, so there's 63 total in the city of New York? Yes. Okay, and uh, how many in the in Community Board 14 and the Rockaways, Broad Channel, uh, Queen? Well, how many in Queens? I mean, that, that would encompass both our districts. How many in Queens? I don't have it separated by borough, but there's about 20 in Brooklyn, and it's single digits in Staten Island. That's fine. And when will those people be able to move back into their homes? Before the end of the year. This year? Yeah. Because we kept setting deadlines and dates, as you know, and we, we couldn't meet those deadlines and dates. But we fully anticipate that for those 63 homeowners, families, that they will be able to move back in their homes before the end of this calendar year. Yes. Okay. You heard it here first on the record. So I want to turn it back over to my colleagues. I want to thank the chairs in particular for their uh, advocacy, especially um, the chair of the uh, Environmental Protection Committee, Costa Constantinides. Uh, he has worked very closely with me on the marine debris issue in Jamaica Bay, along with Donovan Richards, uh, especially at the Sandy, so many boats and other things that were just literally abandoned in the bay. Uh, the city's worked very closely with Department of Sanitation and DEP, and uh, we've got to come up with a larger plan now, but I want to thank Costa for his strong advocacy on this issue. Uh, it's an issue that affects our environment and, uh, and all of our families. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and also Chair Brandon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Orich. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have the uh, Councilmember uh, Mark Traeger from Brooklyn for questions. It's good to be back. <laughs> Thank you to the chairs, to my colleagues. Welcome, uh, I think, many familiar faces here. Um, in the testimony I heard earlier, if you could just uh, refresh my memory, you mentioned that the summer of 2020 will be a key turning point in terms of a study. Which study are, are, you, are you referring to? Uh, it's the Army Corps New, Jersey, New, uh, New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study, or HATS. Because at the meeting that I convened at in this building, which I think you were at, the Army Corps did not say 2020. 
the Army Corps informed me that they're waiting for the completion of the New York, New Jersey Harbor Tributary Study in the year 2022. Uh, the milestone I'm referring to is um, uh, when the Army Corps will choose their tentatively selected plan. There are currently five alternatives that are being considered as part of the study. Each study, each alternative, I'm sorry, includes dozens of projects, um, both in-water projects and land-based projections for not only New York City, but the entire region. Um, and uh, the Army Corps will select one of those alternatives in the summer of 2020, which will provide a lot more clarity as to where, how the study will progress moving forward. But to be clear, the summer of 2020 will not really have news that pertains to Southern Brooklyn as I heard clearly at that meeting. Uh, no, it may. Um, the, the, um, I actually, I would revise my answer and say it definitely will because the, the um, protections that the Army Corps is uh, uh, in considering as part of the New, Jersey, New, uh, New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study are uh, protections that will include all different parts of the city. I think, Council Member, what you're thinking about is um, the Rockaway reformulation, which is a different uh, uh, which, process. Which we were kicked out of uh, because I, I had learned earlier this year that because there was not enough federal money to actualize the Jamaica Bay Reformulation Task Force Task Study, Southern Brooklyn and parts of Queens was moved out of that study. Is that correct? Um, so the, the um, element that was moved out of the study was the Jamaica Bay barrier, the storm surge barrier for Jamaica Bay, including the Coney Island tie-off. And the city has been has long been advocating for the implementation of right. this barrier. We've been pushing the core. We actually did our own study, um, the Coney Island, Reeds, uh, Coney Island Creek raised shoreline study that evaluated that tie-off and provided it to the Army Corps Correct. to accelerate. But those are but those analysis. are studies. Those are studies. Um, those are studies. Th those are not funded studies. Is that correct? Uh, those studies are funded. Um, no, and to actualize, this, to implement the study's findings. Uh, no, there's currently no funding to implement right. those projects. But mm -hmm. what we were working to do, um, since these are such complex projects, was to it, to basically accelerate um, the the analysis that the Army Corps of Engineers has. You to see, do. it's Im it's important for the for the public to to get and my colleagues in the chairs because the meeting I had was very sobering. I want to bring it to the public attention. Um, there was not enough money in the Sandy Appropriations Bill to adequately protect Southern Brooklyn and parts of Queens and other boroughs. Um, we were moved out of, a, first of all, let me back up. When I took office, Southern Brooklyn was not in any study, nothing. Um, Staten Island, to the credit of Staten Island officials, had studies sitting on shelves since the 1950s that were waiting for an appropriations bill from Congress to come down and Sandy ha unfortunately happened, but to the benefit of Staten Island folks, they pulled those studies off the shelves and had money behind it to begin to add up, to begin to implement resiliency work. Southern Brooklyn didn't have anything, and other parts of the city a as well. So uh, to the credit of the administration, uh, of my colleagues, we were able to get into something. It was initially the Jamaica Bay study, but they didn't have enough money for that they only had money for shovel-ready projects out in Nassau County and parts of Long Island. So they moved us out of that and put us into the New York, New Jersey Harbor Tributary Study, which we learned at the meeting I, I convened. There is not enough money for that. So I guess the frustration from my colleagues and from folks is that there are a whole bunch of studies, there are a whole bunch of PowerPoint presentations that are very fancy, but there's no money to implement any of this. That's why when I remember I chaired the Resiliency Committee, when, when folks referred to the Big U project, I called it the half a J. Because there, there's not enough money to even implement, I think, the dot for the J. Okay, it's just, it just there's not much going on. Um, this, is a, this is a major problem. Because I want to just note for the record what the Army Corps also told me, and chairs, it's very important that, that, that we get this on the record. What the Army Corps also told me was that the two boroughs even though, of course, all of New York City is, 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 in, is in the flood uh, danger zone. But the two boroughs that they cautioned the city and they cautioned folks about being the most vulnerable, Brooklyn and Queens, and the two boroughs that have absolutely zero in terms of funding to implement these, all these key studies. So when you say there's more work to do, there's a lot of money that we need to obtain from the federal government and from Albany and from the city dollars to begin to implement this work.
because quite frankly, I am tired of study after study after study after study. We are, in my view, not better prepared, we're better informed, but we're not better prepared. Uh, on the issue of flood insurance, I, I do appreciate your, your the recognition of uh, the home resiliency audits. Uh, FEMA, to the credit of the city of New York, they did contest FEMA's initial findings, which delayed uh, the, the maps. My colleagues are right that that is going to be a significant issue. It might not be a weather storm that will drive people off the coast. It could be a financial storm in the name of flood insurance cost. We pushed in this, in this body to get uh, free elevation certificates for property owners to obtain as a result of these home resiliency studies, which they then can go to their insurer and say, hey, why am I overpaying? Because that document gives you your flood elevation uh, level, which, mo which we found, according to research, over 80% of flood insurance uh, uh, policyholders are overpaying. And so we need to contest that as we're uh, continuing to contest th th these FEMA flood insurance maps. And also, folks, there are some folks with Build a Back program, if they were eligible, they're able to elevate their homes uh, if they met the criteria. But there is a certain equity here, an equity issue. If you have the resources and you're wealthy, you could take steps now to elevate your home and to reduce mitigate flood insurance costs and to protect your property. But if you're, if you're in the poor and working class folks, what program is there to help you? Nothing. Nothing. Um, now, do you believe that there is a way to protect every single part of the city from climate change and rising sea level? Do you think that every inch of New York City can be better protected? Is, I mean, what is your professional view on that? Um, I, I think that we um, uh, are working incredible, with incredible urgency to prepare um, all communities across New York City for the impacts of climate change. Yes. Um, we are, uh, and to your earlier point about flood insurance, um, one of the other things that we are advocating for in Washington is partial mitigation credits. One of the only ways you can decrease your premium right now is um, uh, through elevating your home. And in a dense urban environment like New York City, um, it's not always possible to do that. So we want to make sure that other less expensive uh, retrofits that you can make to your home to make, them, make your home safer can be recognized as um, uh, uh, interventions to um, so I just have a few more questions. I'll turn over to the chairs. But the reason why I, I'm challenging this is because if, if, if New York City knows that we are, there are certain areas that are just so significantly prone to flooding in coastal storms and emergencies, we need to have a land use policy that reflects that. Because when there are zoning changes that add significant density to, in flood zone areas, we're exacerbating the problem. If we know that certain areas flood more than others. Why are we advancing policies that are going to significantly add density and make it make it even more more problematic if we couldn't even evacuate those folks that, that we had we had now? Um, is the city of New Can York? Can I respond to that? Please. Please yes. Um, yeah, I, I'm glad that you raised the point. And um, uh, you know, we have the the dual challenge in the city of having a growing city that is also facing the risks of climate change. Um, so we want to make sure that we're balancing our resiliency and our affordable housing goals. And we have a couple of tools to do this. Um, first, the Department of City Planning has created a new zoning designation called Special Coastal Risk Districts that limits density in the most at-risk neighborhoods. And this is important because um, it is a land use tool like you're talking about. But we've also incorporated the latest understanding of our risk into Appendix G of the building code. So um, any new building permits uh, for new construction or um, substantial rehab takes the, the um, the uh, post-Sandy uh, flood, FEMA flood maps into account um, in uh, the design of, of that building. So the way, the how we build is also as important as where we build. But one of the elements of, of, the, of the city's program for Build It Back was a buyout program, which by the way, I, I, can, go, I can go all day about the issues of Build It Back, but that was one of the options that was supposed to be made available. Does the city of New York still have a buyout program for those properties that are significantly in flood zone areas that are really problematic to rebuild in case of future storms. Is that still on the table for people? Um, so we know that many cities around the world are increasingly looking at buyouts as a tool for <coughs> adaptation. Um, and, and we, you know, th this is a tool that can be incredibly disruptive to, um, to families and communities. So we want to acknowledge that as we, as we think about it. Um, the city implemented, as you mentioned, um, along with the state, 
some targeted buyout programs um, in, in the wake of Sandy. Uh, we currently do not have a, a financing mechanism for continued buyouts. However, we are evaluating the lessons learned from those buyout programs after Sandy. Well, one of the lessons learned is to make it available that it was actually on the table for people. Because I sat through many PowerPoints in my neighborhood in Coney Island for Build It Back, and not once did I see that the option was even available for my, for my residents. I heard about uh, partial rebuild, I heard about re reimbursement, and I heard about full rebuild with elevation. I never saw an option for a buyout. Um, and that was probably because of the rollout of Build It Back, which does predate the de Blasio administration, and I will say that over on the record, that Mayor Bloomberg failed. He failed in terms of the recovery process in many different ways. Um, the last thing I'll say, just with Build It Back and for, and, and for resiliency work, um, Build It Back has a whole host of issues. One of the issues that we, uh, you asked, the, the chair asked the question, would you redo it all over again? One of the things I think the city needs to take into account is that there were groups like Habitat for Humanity and other nonprofits that were ready, willing, and able to take on housing cases from the city to rebuild faster and sooner, but the contracting rules that we set up with HUD was prohibitive. Have you heard that before from other, other folks? Um, I'm not familiar with that, but I'm not involved in implementing the building. Right, program. because as we're talking about funding for resiliency work and studies and all that, we need to look at our own bureaucratic structures that are prohibitive to expediting a thorough and responsible recovery. Um, other parts of New York State front-loaded resources immediately. We kind of front-loaded the bureaucracy, which I, there's arguments for and against that, but precious time was lost and wasted. And there were nonprofits like Habitat for Humanity that said we could take on cases from the back, but their contract structure was prohibitive. So that was one of the, of the lessons learned from that. And the last thing uh, also, uh, FEMA, we heard that before. You're mentioning you're in talks with FEMA. When FEMA decides to reimburse impacted uh, residents in terms of damages to their properties, are you aware that they use uh, national standards in terms of pricing for reimbursement for items? So if someone has a boiler damage in their property in New York City, FEMA says, well, what's the price of a boiler in Idaho or in Iowa? That could be very different in New York. Matter of fact, I think we're the most expensive city probably in the world, right? So have you talked to them about using pricing reimbursement structures that actually align with New York pricing? Has that been a part of the conversation? Um, we're working with FEMA on a number of fronts to make sure that their policies work for New York City. Okay, and do we have design build for resiliency work? Um, I, I, uh, I believe we, we now have design build. Uh, can I get back to you on that question, please? Please, because we should not, it takes right now like eight years to build a bathroom in a park. It should not take this time for design. Thank you, chairs, for, for your time. Thank you, Councilmember Traeger. Uh, very quickly, how do we look at land use? I think that, you know, Councilmember Traeger, just we talked a little bit about that. And you, know, you have a surface, you know, we sort of have a, a, a plot on the waterfront that a supermarket just built a 725 uh, car parking lot fully paved. In the era of dealing with what we know, how, how did we allow that to happen? How do we sort of think about, you know, sort of land use on our waterfronts that, that a, you know, concreted 725 you know, space parking lot was allowed to be built on the waterfront when we have so many needs for resiliency measures to be there? Um, I, I'm not familiar with the exact project that you're talking about. Uh, the Wegmans? Uh, <laughs> oh, the, oh, the line, okay. Um, I, 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 um, so, uh, in general, like I said, it's not just about where we build, but it's also about how we build. And um, our, our building code um, reflects uh, the highest resiliency standards. Um, and we're continuing to, to um, uh, push the needle on this front. So for example, as part of our um, work with uh, FEMA on the, the flood maps, we also came to an agreement to develop a new future-looking flood risk product that we're in the process of developing, um, and we hope to build into to, uh, incorporate into building code and zoning code moving forward. But, but you know, you know, allowing for a 725 space parking lot on the waterfront, I mean, just on so many levels, right? Not breaking car culture, increased emissions, not permeable, like there's so many you know, sort of checks there that we miss. How are we making sure something like that doesn't happen again? And I'm gonna pass it over to Council Member Rose. 
um, we need to create a culture of resiliency. We need to start bringing the, uh, the lens of resiliency into all city actions and investments. And I think we have some important tools that already help us do that, and uh, there, there's more work to do. Thank you. Councilmember Rose? Followed by Councilmember Richards. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I'm going to be brief because I know how excited you are to get back in, you know, in the fray. So um, uh, I think Councilmember Traeger, at least for me, um, like sort of took us to church. So I just wanted to say an amen to, you know, his remarks. Um, and so uh, I want to I want to start by saying, you know, I acknowledge and um, and I thank. Uh, folks for what they're doing with the Staten Island Seawall project, you know, and our wetlands uh, resili resiliency project. Um, I represent the North Shore, and the North Shore and the northwestern portion of my district were severely impacted um, by uh, storm surge and, um, uh, and Hurricane Sandy. It resulted in hundreds of millions of dollars in um, damage, yet it was rarely acknowledged or given much attention. Um, what is being what what is in the plan to safeguard these areas of Staten Island, which we've seen um, an extensive amount of erosion? Um, our shoreline, in fact, has been so severely impacted that the North Shore Railroad lines are. And, and much of that area is now underwater. So what in the plan, what is the plan to safeguard uh, the North Shore and the Northwestern Shore of Staten Island? Uh, thank you, Council Member, for the question. Um, so uh, the North Shore of Staten Island is um, an area that is uh, uh, integrally part of the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study. So we're looking at comprehensive solutions through that study that will protect that area. The North Shore of Staten Island is also very vulnerable to um, uh, the impacts of uh, heavy precipitation. And so we're also focusing on, on that particular area as part of the stormwater uh, resiliency study that we have ongoing now that will um, be completed by the end of next year. So when can we see something? I, I haven't heard of any plans for um, the North Shore. Um, there was, and, and we are impacted by the Blue Belt. We have, you know, the wetlands project is in the, pretty much in the western portion of, of Staten Island. But I have not heard or even been a part of any conversation about resiliency or, or protecting um, the North Shore. Um, well, we're very happy to come and brief you, and I was really hoping that we would uh, uh, have a chance to talk before this hearing, uh, Council Member Rose. Um, and I uh, would, would be happy to come brief your office on the work that uh, Um, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers New York New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study um, will uh, reach an important milestone in the selection of a tentatively selected plan by next summer. Um, at that point, we'll have a better sense of what projects um, uh, could protect the North Shore that are part of that, that study. And are you um, addressing sea rise and storm surge concurrently? That's right. We're, well, it's the Army Corps' uh, work, but they are accounting for in, in their um, solutions that address storm surge, they're accounting for future sea level rise, but there are also land-based protections that are included um, in, in their analysis that would protect coastal communities from sea level rise specifically. And just to echo uh, my colleagues, uh, I have gotten a lot of feedback about um, the flood maps and um, my constituents' of ability to afford flood insurance. So I hope that we're also looking at some way or some provisions on which we can help subsidize or, or some type of provisions for those who really are going to be economically impacted, negatively economically impacted by the increase in flood insurance. Right. So as you know, FEMA runs the National Flood Insurance Program um, and we have been uh, advocating aggressively um, on, uh, in, with both sides of, of uh, the aisle and in both chambers of Congress to reform the National Flood Insurance Program and include means-tested vouchers, mean, meaning 
setting rates based on people's ability to pay because we are so concerned about affordability of flood insurance and we will continue to do that and certainly invite you or any of the other council members um, partnership in uh, pushing FEMA and Congress to take on this important issue. If, if we can't get FEMA um, or the federal government to do it, what is New York City doing? Is there, is there anything that New York City is doing to help in terms of uh, maybe helping to subsidize or um, this this is a, a a federal issue. So um, I know it's a federal issue, but it impacts our local our local constituencies. So um, given that we don't have a lot of control over what happens on the federal level, is there any contingency plan or is there any plan to try to augment whatever comes out of, of the federal government. Um, we'd hap be happy to discuss ideas with you in your office. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rose, Council Member Richards. Thank you, Chairs, uh, for this important hearing. And let me first start off by uh, thanking the administration for, uh, I'm going to start off saying nice things and then we'll roll back. Uh, um, <laughs> the work that they've done on the boardwalk and obviously uh, a lot of the strategic investment we've seen in Southeast Queens when it comes to flooding, when I think DEP for over $2 billion in infrastructure money. Um, so the question was raised, are we closer to being ready in the event of another storm um, earlier? And I would argue no, we're, we're technically not out of the woods on this and I'll say I think at least for the Rockaways, there's been a lot of great work done um, on the beach side, but we're still vulnerable, just as, we're just as vulnerable as we were um, when Sandy hit seven years ago um, today. Um, so I know you raised some, some um, or you, you spoke of progress on the Edgemere plan, and I just wanted to hear a little bit more about where are we uh, in the process of moving that resiliency project forward on the base side. And let me just remind everyone that 70% of the population of the Rockaways is in my portion of the Rockaways. Not to say we all are not in it together, but I say that to say when you talk about the questions of affordability, well, as we talk about flood insurance, the, my community is probably one of the most vulnerable communities in the city because in the event of a storm, they, they, they can't build it back. You know, so I just want to hear a little bit more about where are we uh, with the feds uh, on that project. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, so uh, we, uh, the city, uh, uh, did a comprehensive um, resiliency plan for, for Edgemere, as you know. Um, it was led by HPD, and we looked at not only the regular tidal uh, flooding and funding issues that the community faces, but also other challenges um, the community faces, such as um, lack of affordable housing, um, uh, just the revital need for, to revitalize um, commercial corridors um, and other, other related issues. Um, one of the uh, projects that we um, uh, hope to advance through that plan was a raised shoreline for Edgemere to protect the neighborhood from um, high frequency floods. And uh, that project has now, is now being advanced by the Army Corps of Engineers as part of the Rockaway reformulation. So we're working with them to uh, first design the project and then move it forward into construction. And when do we anticipate that project to start? Um, I don't have those dates in front of me now because the Army Corps is still um, uh, designing the project, but um, I can uh, come back to you as soon as we so have So that means I'm going to have more gray hair by the time it starts. Um, <laughs> I, will say I have 13 gray hairs here, I'm counting 13. <laughs> so <that> means, <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, Steve. Um, so that, that answer to me, and I, I think in, you know, anyways, it, it leaves our communities much more vulnerable in the event of a, of a storm, I think. And I know the Army Corps is supposedly advancing their project, but we, we've been here a long time. It was supposed to advance this 20 years ago um, as well. Um, let me go to NYCHA quick. So I know the city had a report this morning that uh, Superstorm Sandy damaged 35 NYCHA developments. And as of August this year, uh, work at only two of these developments are complete. Uh, can you just speak to what, why are we still delayed? And I appreciate the work that we're seeing in the Rockaways amongst all of the developments, even though I'm very unhappy with um, the 
jobs portion of it, I, I still don't see a lot of NYCHA residents working on these projects um, across the borough, but across the city. And I think the city needs to do a better job at ensuring that local people who live in these communities who have billions of dollars being spent in their developments have an opportunity to have upward mobility. So I just want to throw that out there again. Uh, but can you speak to where are we at uh, with NYCHA developments? Uh, why are only two developments done? And when do we anticipate all 35 developments to be completed? Um, the city is investing $3 billion into NYCHA recovery and resiliency projects citywide. Uh, NYCHA is uh, managing that entire uh, portfolio of uh, construction projects. And unfortunately, they're not here today. So we'll follow up with you to give you a full update on the NYCHA recovery and resiliency. So project. are you aware of any of NYCHA's I projects? Wanna, I don't want to speak for, for NYCHA since they're managing their own so we will, um, we will follow up with you. Oh. Don't, don't, don't call out. I know they're in here. N NYCHA but, was but invited to. And NYCHA was invited but didn't see fit to come today. Not a good job, Mr. Ch new chairman. Um, uh, let's just go to South Queens for a second. So we're still dealing with a, with a big water table issue there. And I know um, some individuals have called for uh, groundwater. Uh, the groundwater issue to be addressed. So can DEP speak to where we at um, with addressing groundwater? Sure. Um, uh, we had been doing a study to see uh, if there were some shorter term fixes that we could do to uh, help reduce the groundwater uh, table. It looks like they're, they're really not feasible and, and very costly. And so we're, unfortunately, we're sort of continuing to, to figure out what we can do to help alleviate um, the issues that your residents are experiencing and we uh, again reiterate our call to give us specific examples of where it's taking place so that we can do sort of a, uh, a direct uh, fix for property owners that are dealing with the problem because we're not finding sort of a wholesale solution that's going to work and so we really want to zero in on the ones that are dealing with it the most um, and so would appreciate Is buyouts on the, on, on the table because today I'm sure these individuals basements are swimming in water um, or they could swim in their basements. So has there been any conversations with the state for some of these low-lying areas to perhaps do a buyout program if we can't address the water table issue? Not to my knowledge, but I think, you know, if there's a desire to have that conversation, I know a lot of people are not looking to, to sell, but if, if there's that conversation to be had, I'm sure we're happy to have it. Um, just getting back to the affordability issue around flood insurance, and I didn't hear um, a direct answer to that question yet from the administration. And I, I have no faith in the federal government on climate change. Um, so I, I heard you speak of perhaps these vouchers, um, but I'm concerned that's never gonna happen, that I think we are living in fantasy land if we think the Trump administration is going to provide vouchers, especially to the needy. That's just my opinion. Um, so is the city looking at any program? And I know the Center for New York City Neighborhoods has done a lot of great work with us in terms of the flood and why program. And I, I, I obviously sit on the board, so in all transparency, I'll say that. Um, but is there any plans for the city to provide direct subsidy to people who live in the most vulnerable communities? Has there been any more of a thought, or are we just gonna keep punting it to the federal government, knowing that that's never gonna happen? Um, well, this is a federal program, um, and uh, there is no precedent for municipal governments to provide subsidies um, around flood insurance. It's a program that's managed by FEMA. Um, we have been uh, showing a tremendous amount of leadership and our recommendations for both means-tested vouchers as well as partial mitigation credits have been well received, like I said, in both chambers of Congress and both sides of the aisle. And they're really, the, the research that we have done on flood insurance affordability serves as the basis for the debates that are happening in Congress on flood insurance. So we are um, uh, leading the way in, in that front. And as you mentioned, we've got Flood Help and Why, which um, is a program to make people aware of their flood risk, provide flood insurance counseling, and help navigate this very complex program. Get that. And mm -hmm. um, uh, provide resiliency audits. Counseling is not going to help you when you got to pay. So, um, and, and it's great. I'm not saying that we don't need it. 
Um, but I'm more interested in setting a new president than it's, I mean, just because no one else has done it doesn't mean that we shouldn't entertain here in New York City offering a program that can offer subsidy or some sort of grant uh, to homeowners under certain income guidelines uh, right here uh, in our city. So I, I don't think we should necessarily punt on this issue. New York City has been a leader on a lot of issues. Uh, UPK, I mean, we could go down the list of things that we are trying to lead on. And I think here's an opportunity for us to show even a little bit more leadership and lead the way uh, in figuring out ways to help those who are in the, who can lose their homes. You know, this is reality. Those who will be pushed out of waterfront communities as new development and speculation happens, right? Um, and I'm not one who says we need to retreat from the shoreline. I'm all in because I think communities like mine have been disinvested in for a long time, but there's a, there has to be a way for us to figure out a medium on how to make sure those who stayed in these communities seven years later, rebuilt everything, uh, there has to be a way that the city focuses on ensuring that they can stay there uh, for the remainder or however long they feel they, they want to stay there. Uh, well, we'd be happy to talk to your office about ideas that you have to make flood insurance more affordable. I just need money. <laughs> We don't need a conversation. We can see it in the budget. All righty. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Richards, uh, Councilmember Rivera, followed by Councilmember Levin. Thank you so much uh, for allowing me to join you and, get, and have a couple minutes to ask questions. I agree with Councilmember Richards about precedent. We have unprecedented rises in sea level. We have unprecedented changes that are happening to our communities and we have to start with a short term and a long term vision and implement that right away. And, you know, Council Member Richards also mentioned NYCHA resiliency work and I am one, I have one of those developments, Jacob Reese Houses, that has had a very long delay, something that was supposed to start years ago and is really just now kicking off. And I've actually called for an audit of NYCHA resiliency work so how is the city partnering with NYCHA to ensure that the work is done safely? Because on, on the same development that I mentioned, we had a partial crane collapse. And I'm afraid that some of the conditions on these developments, they're just, uh, they're dangerous and some of the work is being done so quickly and rushed that it's being done haphazardly. So how is the coordination? Um, thanks for the, member, the question, Council Member Rivera. I um, am not able to speak to NYCHA work um, right now, but we'll uh, follow up with you about uh, We ask you because the mayor appoints the chair and oversees this entity, so we were hoping for a little bit more information. So I have 100, 100, over 100,000 people that live in the floodplain, 10,000 families of, of those individuals are living in NYCHA. All of my waterfront is public housing, and we saw places with up to eight feet of water. The good news is that we are getting an investment from the city to build, to really create and build the first coastal resiliency project in all of New York City. I wanna support my colleagues here and say we need to bring that same investment to the outer boroughs right away. Manhattan is the best borough, it's, it's the greatest. I, hold, I, but, but, but we are nothing. Put the clock on, please. We are, we are nothing without the other four and so, as, as someone who, who loves her community, but understands that Red Hook, Far Rockaway, all of these communities also need that same investment. I wanna ask you about the community engagement process because the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project has actually been very challenging in an uphill battle for us. I think it's been unnecessarily challenging because of the community outreach issues that we have had. And recently we announced phase in construction for this five year project air quality monitoring for the dirt that is being brought in to raise the park and submitting the project to Envision to, convert, to confirm that the environmental standards are actually met and that our community feels good about what's going down. But none of that would have happened without the community's input. And so I wanna ask you going forward, since this is the first one and we're happy to be kind of this incubator of innovation and the first of many, how have you learned from those community outreach challenges and what are you going to do differently to make sure that people feel included in the process? Um, 
Well, first of all, as an outer borough resident myself, let me just assure you that there are uh, major coastal resiliency projects happening in the outer boroughs as well on the, actually the same timeline as the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. So next year we'll break ground on four major coastal uh, resiliency projects across the city, one in Stat two in Staten Island, one in Queens, and one in Manhattan. Um, but in terms of communi community engagement, I'm really glad that you raised this. Community engagement is absolutely critical to the, uh, the design and, um, and uh, uh, conceptualization of these uh, coastal resiliency projects. What we're talking about here is actually transforming our waterfronts and integrating flood protection into the waterfront along with the many other things that we rely on the waterfront for. Um, and, and we take community engagement incredibly seriously um, and uh, want to make sure that we're creating ample opportunities for the community to really work with us, provide their input, um, and, and also tell us what won't work in a certain community um, and uh, are, are really taking that to heart as we um, implement these projects citywide. Well, I, I agree with you. I, I just want you to make sure we, we did a lot of work on this project and we, we have to make sure that we're honoring the community's vision and that we're moving forward as quickly as possible because we have no time to, to wait. And I just want it to be done. I want us to learn from this project and do everything a little bit better, smarter, more efficiently, and hopefully the, the most cost effective uh, pos as possible. Absolutely. And as for, you know, NYCHA not being here and being invited, you still have the Office of Emergency Management, you still have the Department of Buildings, you still have the Department of Parks and Recreation. All of these agencies are, are involved in some of these larger projects throughout the city. And so that's why we're looking for more answers from you when it comes to interagency coordination. So I hope that in the future you can have a, a bit more detail for us on that. But I thank you for your testimony and for being here, and I thank the chairs for being so gracious with their time. Thank you, Councilmember Rivera. Councilmember Levin. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for being here and testi testifying. Um, uh, I just wanted to um, add my voice to the concerns raised by Councilmember Richards and Councilmember Rivera around NYCHA, and there's a, uh, in my district, Gowanus Houses um, was a Sandy um, rehab project. Um, I believe it was something like $50 million in capital funds from FEMA was spent there. Um, and you know, there were a handful of residents um, that had the opportunity to work on that site. Uh, and it was immensely frustrating. My office put in a fair amount of time working with NYCHA to try to um, get into the pathways to apprenticeship program and then into apprenticeships. And it, it was an immensely frustrating process. And I, I don't even, you know, maybe three or four residents got a chance to work on a, on a $50 million capital project. So that's very disappointing because um, we had the opportunity to, um, to really make an impact uh, and use uh, that type of program to employ people in the communities. So, um, you know, it's, it's an ongoing issue and I hope that if, um, you know, God forbid this happens in the future where we have another storm like this, um, uh, that we don't, you know, make the same mistakes, but really actually take this on as a, as a real issue because um, that's a community that suffered as a result of the storm and then, um, you know, was not able to participate in that, in that recovery. Um, I wanted to ask just about with Build It Back. Um, saw the the article in um, the Staten Island Advance this week um, uh, around. It was um, Assemblymember Maliotakis talking about um, with with homeowners saying that they there the issues around the workmanship at um, at a lot of the amongst the contractors in the Build It Back program. So. While realizing that 99.9% .9 of the repairs have been done, I think that the, the questions that they raised are around um, uh, the quality of the work. And can you speak to that exactly? And how is the administration dealing then with claims of you know, poor workmanship in the build back program? So uh, every house that we work on has a one-year warranty. So mm -hmm. the, any concern that the homeowner may have, there's a warranty process that they go through. and Basically, the city holds the contractor accountable for that mm -hmm. whole year. How many, um, how many uh, claims have there been on those warranties? I don't have that in front of me. I mean, we're constantly 
getting warranty claims and closing them out, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's an ongoing thing. Um, you know, as we finish houses, then that kicks in the warranty process. Mm -hmm. Is it a widespread issue? I mean, it, it could be, it could be any number of issues. Um, mm -hmm. Some, most are very minor, and mm -hmm. some are larger issues when winter comes with frozen pipes and so forth. Usually, mm -hmm. it's, they're just small, typical repairs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might need, you know, a, a more something to be redesigned or so forth. But mm -hmm. one way or the other, within the year, anything that the city did is guaranteed. Right. Do you have any concerns around some, any of the contractors that were part of Build It Back? So from the press conference, the contractors, you know, we're at the end of the program. They're going mm -hmm. through their final payment stages, and the city has an audit process like any other mm -hmm. city project. And, you know, they're, they're going to have to go through that audit process. They have plenty of avenues to dispute the process through mm -hmm. commissioner's determinations and the controller, and they're going to have to do that. The Some of them have decided they want to have press conferences and do liens, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, the city has a very established process to audit um, and, you know, they handle their disputes. And the findings from, um, you, mean, you mean audit for all of the contractors or is it audit per, per repair? It's usually per contract, Per right? contract. So okay. every job is a, is a specific contract. Okay. Um, and so the audits that have been, are those audits public? I, I'm not sure. It's like the typical uh, engineering audit that you know, mm -hmm. it would happen on any other city project, so I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact answer. Is there a broader um, review of, of that issue? I'm just, I'm, is there a broader review of that issue with the Build It Back program? In a, in, in, in a, uh, you know, for all 1,900 um, Build It Back projects, homes, are there, is, there a, is there a kind of overall audit for the entire program? I'm not sure exactly. Is there a, is there a public facing um, uh, review of? Um, so, so HUD requires a constant um, cost reasonableness. Mm -hmm. Those, those audits have been done uh, throughout the, throughout the program. Okay. I mean, in, in the sense that, you know, we have an MMR for a lot of metrics um, on city um, city programs. Is there, are there, are there, are, are there accountability metrics and build it back that are publicly facing? Uh, yeah, I mean, everything has to, it's a, it's a, it's a construction contract. Everything is, has to be verified uh, by the audit, uh, by the special inspectors, by the mm -hmm. city. So everything is verified in person. Okay, but is that, I'm just saying, is that, is that public? In other words, can, can my office or any uh, New Yorker go online and kind of judge for themselves the effectiveness of the Build It Back program? I, I don't think, I'm not sure that it's online, no. Okay. Um, all right, I mean, something just to, to think about, you know, seven years out now and just making sure that we're, you know, that there are, there are going to be lessons learned and that we know what those lessons are so that we don't, repeat any issues that, that may have come up in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. Um, the last question that I have is relating to NYCHA as well. Um, how is our coordination with the federal government relating to uh, funding for, so I'll, let, I'll use an example, a story houses in my district. Eight buildings were flooded and damaged. The other buildings on the property were not. But all those properties still remain in a flood zone. And yet, the only FEMA funding that is sort of being accessed is to repair and move systems, you know, make them more resilient in the eight buildings that were damaged. But the buildings that are still sitting in a flood zone that are sitting next to those, those buildings are not getting those same treatment. Um, is there any movement with the federal government? Like how are we reconciling this? Because we shouldn't have to wait for the next storm to harden infrastructure around NYCHA and make sure that all of the buildings uh, in these flood zones are being dealt with in the same manner. And right now, uh, because of the way the, the federal government has structured the FEMA dollars, we can't access them only for those buildings that were damaged. And that, I think that's sort of a bad model. It sets us up to be in a bad place were there to be another storm. I couldn't agree with you more, Council Member, and I 
think that this is not just an issue that pertains to public housing, but it's an issue that pertains to all of our resiliency investments citywide. Unfortunately, we have a system where most adaptation and resiliency dollars flow from the federal government reactively after a disaster. But these are problems that we need to address proactively, and we absolutely need funding streams from the federal government that enable us to take proactive action. Has the state, is the state, what full role does the, the state government play in any funding sources to any of these resiliency projects? Um, is there a need for us to go to Albany and ask them for dollars that the federal government is not providing? Uh, there is always room to ask for more dollars. <laughs> okay, well, that's going to be, it's on the checklist. And uh, um, I thank you for your time. I know you've been on the stand for quite a long time. I appreciate you doing that. The only thing I will ask is that I don't, definitely don't want to see this entire side of the room walk out of the room now that your testimony is done. If you guys could leave people behind to hear all of the experts that are here in this room, uh, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Adrian Espinosa from New York uh, League of Conservation Voters. Proud to leave. Okay, uh, Paul Galay, Jessica Roth, uh, Mike from Riverkeeper, any of you still here? Karen uh, Imus from the Waterfront Alliance, you still here, Karen? There you are. And maybe you can get Rosenzweig and Orton. How many people are still here? Yeah, we're, we're calling you now. Uh, we're doing the best that we can. Let me see who, so we have. Cynthia Rosenswig from uh, NASA as well. And Philip Orton. Can we squeeze them all together? And Philip Orton as well. All right, we'll get them all on the table. Thank then. you. Yes. Because otherwise they're going to be. Uh, So we are going to use a five-minute clock um, per, per, uh, for testimony because we know we are running way behind. Um, so we are going to try to do this in an orderly fashion. So I will put a five-minute clock on everyone. Um, if you need to go over, I'm not going to – we're not going to go crazy about it, but we are going to encourage to stick to the five minutes. Thank you. Starting again. <laughs> make sure, start again, make sure you're on the record. <laughs> okay. I'm Dr. Cynthia Rosenzweig. I've uh, been the co-chair of the New York City Panel on Climate Change uh, since it was um, founded in 2008. Thanks, thank you to the committee chairs and the committee uh, for inviting the NPCC and uh, my colleague also, Dr. Philip Orton from the NPCC, um, is going to um, go uh, tell you more about the science. Um, after this. Um, on the occasion of the seventh anniversary of uh, Hurricane Sandy, it is really, I think, it, it's important to recognize that it really was the tipping point here for New York City and its response to climate change. Um, uh, even though it's very hard to uh, attribute any one storm still to climate change, um, in terms of awareness and response, the city had been uh, working on climate change ahead of Hurricane Sandy, uh, but what the NPCC often says is it was in lower gear. And then after Hurricane Sandy, that tipping point, it really went into high gear in terms of responses. Uh, so many of the impacts of Hurricane Sandy did involve the topics that are germane to the bills in front of the council um, this afternoon. 
because of the coastal water, the coastal flooding that, um, that caused so much damage. New York City, on pan New York City Panel on Climate Change uh, is a panel of experts, not just in climate science, but social science, health, and risk management. It was formed in 2008, so we uh, actually celebrated the 10th anniversary of the NPCC uh, earlier this year. It provides regular climate risk information, updates to the city of New York under Local Law 42. And I want to point out that Local Law 42, a law of the city council, was passed in August of 2012, before Hurricane Sandy. Um, and what I'm going to share with you very quickly in my probably now three minutes um, is some of the uh, findings from the uh, latest NPCC report. And then, as I said, Dr. Orton's going to, s to drill down in particular about the, um, the coastal flooding. So um, what, um, what the New York City Panel on Climate Change, now known as the NPCC, provides is it looks at the observations and then gives the projections, drilled down, what we call downscaled or right-scaled for New York City. Um, and what these are showing is the observations in temperature, precipitation, and sea level rise, and the projections um, that we make through time. And while it's very hard, again, to say, um, because of the short time frame and the very fine spatial scales, you can see that the observations are trending in the projections that have been made um, uh, since the first set was made in 2010. And the 2015 are the projections that are the projections that are used by New York City in their programs that were just described uh, by um, uh, Director Baveshi and others. Very, very quickly, I'm not going to give you all these numbers or uh, give you a test at the end of this, but um, because extreme events are so important, and remember also, it's important to remember it is not just sea level rise and coastal flooding. Things that we care about, like days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit now around 10 um, uh, degrees uh, in our current climate could go up to almost 60 at the highest end of the projections in the 2050s. Heavy rainfall also was discussed uh, there, um, in, our, in the previous uh, panel. Um, and here, just the number of days of rainfall greater than one inch, now about 13. Um, uh, the high estimate is for can many more days, more days um, of those heavy rainfalls, which caused the in inland flooding that was contrasted. Um, on the sea level rise, um, we, uh, the New York City uh, the panel this time felt it was very important not only to show the um, ones that were similar to what the, our NOAA colleague uh, showed at the very beginning of the hearing, but also to say with, we did uh, extra work looking at the Atlantic rapid ice melt and that for it, the awareness of long-term risk, there's the potential in 2100 of almost 10 feet of sea level rise. What we do then is make our own maps for New York City. I'm almost done. <laughs> I'm almost done. And this is what uh, Philip will be um, sharing much more information about, about what those projected coastal flooding will be. We also look, this was great, dis great highly discussed uh, frequently in our last panel on the community-based adaptation and the vulnerability across the differing neighborhoods and geographies of New York. Finally, indicators and monitoring, so important to, um, uh, to really create that integrated understanding of climate change as it goes forward. These are the design guidelines that our NPCC projections went into, um, uh, went into these, um, um, uh, Director Baveshi um, uh, described those as well in her testimony. These were, uh, finally, these were the overall NPCC3 recommendations. Um, the first was that the city should establish a pilot climate indicators and monitoring system. No other city in the whole world has this. And this will very much help the citizens of New York understand what is going on about climate change. Uh, it's also important to con conduct integrated climate assessments for the New York metropolitan region, not only the five boroughs, it's we need to connect to our, reg to our region as well. 
We need to, in, as we always do, incorporate updated methods and analyses. And finally, we have the idea, this is in part speaking to some of the things I think that the council, um, council people were saying, is that by hosting a climate summit periodically, we can bring all of these together, do, get the connectivity really going and really communicate with all the players involved. Thank you very much. And now Philip. Thank you. Before Philip, is there someone here who still works for the, for the administration? Okay, great. That's a lot of people clear out, which I ask that not to happen. But you're here. Good. <laughs> Sorry about that, Phil. So thanks for the invitation. I, I don't remember being told I only had five minutes, so I'm going to show, out of my 13 or so slides, I'll just show about six. So I'm going to I'm going to reflect on some consensus science for a few slides and then and then talk about some input on these on these bills. The consensus science uh, shows that uh, you know from NPCC, uh, which you've already heard about, on which I'm a member, shows the projections of sea level rise from the the minuses are 10th percentile, the pluses are 90th percentile, so it's an 80 percent confidence interval. I mean, the first thing I'd say seeing this is these are huge uncertainties. So going out to 2100. Um, so as that's been mentioned already today, there's a lot of uncertainty. It's good to plan and, and build in some uh, some ability to adapt your plans in the future. Um, okay. And so what we mapped in 2015 was the 100-year flood from the FEMA preliminary 100-year flood map, not being used for insurance purposes because of the appeal from New York City. Um, but that's being used for planning, and, and that was mapped with additional sea level rise. And, and this looks very alarming. It shows huge swaths of uh, South Queenstown, South Brooklyn, as somebody noted earlier, uh, particularly large areas that are vulnerable to 100-year floods, which are only, only going to get worse with sea level rise, with accelerating sea level rise. What we did in the past, um, we, we noted, you know, the city noted, and, and I noted that um, looking at how high tides are going to increase with flooding is a common thing, but really what's hitting, hitting some neighborhoods already is monthly high tides, so spring tide or king tide. And so we mapped that for the latest, and, and this is a part of uh, New Hamilton, Hamilton Beach. Um, and so we mapped the, the monthly tidal flooding, which is an innovative new, new metric of flood mapping. And so that's shown in the latest report. And that shows what's, this is again though 90th percentile sea level rise. The city wants to see a high end sea level rise estimate just to be safe and, and conservatively planned. Um, so it's not guaranteed to happen this way, but, but you see the, the colors in the top center, the solid colors are the 90th percentile. Um, don't, the hatched areas that cover JFK and some other areas even further inland are an extreme Antarctic or rapid ice melt scenario that has a very, very low probability of happening this century, but, but we still map that in that report. So even some, er some areas like Rockaway Peninsula are likely by mid-century are going to have a lot of monthly flooding, um, or certainly by the 2080s. And there's some neighborhoods that already have it, such as Hamilton Beach, as I showed, and some areas where water bubbles up through the sewer system, uh, which isn't working properly which the city is actually addressing some of those cases. So uh, I think it's good that you're planning and thinking about, um, you know, supplementing what the what the, the Blasio's office is doing, looking at at um, adaptation. These, and it's already been mentioned, so I'll be really brief here. I agree, based on my scientific expertise, that the next set of flood maps likely will be more like the preliminary maps that we're seeing that are that double the size of the flood zone. I think that's what I'm seeing coming down the pipe too. It's hard to know exactly what to come out with, but, but I know that based on a lot of my scientific um, knowledge of the topic. And it's mainly because Hurricane Sandy's now in their data sets. It wasn't when that last study's data set were cut off in 2009, so. Um, in terms of number 1620, the five borough plan to protect the shoreline, I think you should, one simple thing is you could not use the word protection. That's something the Corps of Engineers is trying not to use. People, it's just good to have it in people's minds that you're just reducing risk, but there's always a bigger hurricane that, that won't be prepared for under those uh, protection plans. Um, and then the other thing that I think is coming up is, you know, it says in that bill that you can't contradict the core harbor and tributary study. So that's confusing to me, so I'm not sure why you do it if you can't contradict it. I think you need to just fine tune that. I mean, in 10 years, there will need to be more study. So if this is every 10 years going forward, then that'll be ancient history in 10 years. And we'll know so much more about sea level rise in 10 years or 20 years. So, but I think that's confusing because at, at first when I wrote this, I saw, I said, well, the new thing about, about your bill is that it addresses sea level rise, and, and maybe the HAT study doesn't. But when you look at it closely, they do address sea level rise. Um, and that, people get confused about that, and I'm still a little confused about that. 
but they are accounting for sea level rise, and they are built costing out building walls on the waterfront that would adapt to sea level rise. Where their cost benefit benefit to cost ratio comes out, well, if the city's going to do something different and not go by benefit cost ratio, then maybe the city will have a different perspective on this. But I'm not sure what's different about what the city would do, you know, if the city can't contradict the course study, and that's what it said in the bill. So that that confuses me. Um, I like how it, that it mentions strategic relocation, so buyouts, and I think it's nice to hear other people, committee members, talking about buyouts. It's just something that should be there, a good deal for someone or a community as a group to, to move. Um, give them a good deal um, if they're in harm's way and if there's a bad storm and have it ready the day after the storm, not a year later or two years later. And uh, I think uh, one more, and, and this is where I was commenting on, on the uh, possibility of non-structural measures of buyouts. I think I recommend that be kept in there, even though sometimes politics makes that a harder topic to address. And then my recommendation on the special flood hazard area notification, and, and Vivian Gornitz submitted comments, which um, pointed this out, and, and I agree with her. I, I don't recommend that you just notify people in the 100-year flood zone, the zone A, um, the special flood hazard areas. I think o if OEM's doing any notifications, they should be for anyone in any flood zone. We shouldn't cut the line off. You know, remember Hurricane Sandy with the zone A or 100-year flood zones back in 2012, a lot of people got flooded who aren't in that zone. It went way beyond that zone. So you want to notify everyone if you're going to use OEM. Uh, so, so I think you just have to be careful. The flood zones don't delineate the end of risk. So there's a couple suggestions there. You might notify people in areas that go beyond the 100-year flood zone. And that's it. Thank you very much. Happy to answer questions if you have time. Thank you. No, we're going we're gonna to keep going and I'll ask everybody questions. If, yeah. Moving down the line. Yes. I'm Paul Gallet. I'm the president of Hudson Riverkeeper. I'm joined by Jessica Roth. And I would like to cede half my time if I have five together with Jessica. You tell me whether you want me to take five or yeah. two and a half. Yeah, sure. five, five each. So five each, OK. Everybody Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also joined by Mike Dulong, who can help answer questions about some of the bills, all of which we are very uh, firmly in support of. First, I want to recognize the suffering and the loss that so many people experienced seven years ago and since, and in some cases continue to do. And I know everybody feels that way, and I'm just uh, fortunate to be the first to say it on behalf of everybody in the room. But second, I want to say that the uh, barriers plan, the large in water barriers that has been put forward in discussion so far, uh, the, the flaws are extraordinarily significant first and most fundamental of which is that while Dr. Orton is correct and Ms. Vivesi is correct that sea level rise is factored into the storm surge barrier plan, it's only factored in insofar as the storm surge barrier plan is seeking to solve for storm surge. It's not meant to deal with plain old, everyday, sunny day, sea level rise that we're going to experience to, I think one of the figures given was two to four feet by the end of the century, 20 inches by 2050. This solves a portion of the problem while completely failing to solve the larger everyday problem. That's unfortunately not the only or possibly even the largest problem with the barriers plan. Uh, they are prohibitively expensive they are a shiny object that's being held out as a way to solve our problem all in one fell swoop that will almost certainly never get funded if you look at the efforts to fund the Cross Harbor Tunnel, which I think is five to $10 billion. Uh, it's being laughed at in Washington. It's getting no traction. Some of these barriers are costed out at $68 billion. There has been commentary in local newspapers that we might not even know whether these barriers would work until after they were built. Now that may sound absurd, but unfortunately there is an article in Scientific American talking about the barriers in New Orleans that says that they are sinking and they're expected to protect New Orleans for about four years at a cost of $15 billion. That's, that's just the headline of the story. Boston has assessed whether to build large in-water barriers and found that it is a bad idea. Other communities like Venice, they have taken their shot at barriers. The Venice barriers are late. They are experiencing engineering and operational difficulties. Even the ones in the, the Netherlands, 
the folks who are working on the Netherlands now, as, as Jessica Ralph will uh, talk about in detail in a moment, are saying, you know, we have to practice wiser ways to deal with the oncoming model. Just today, the New York Times, literally while we're sitting here, put up a story entitled, Rising Seas Will Erase More Cities by 2050. New research shows, new research showing that perhaps we have underestimated the damage that will be caused by rising seas by a factor of two. And so we are in the soup, and we have got to solve our problems comprehensively. We've got to solve them principally at the local level, and we've got to solve them in a manner that doesn't just focus on one aspect of climate-related difficulty. Uh, fortunately, New York City has some projects that it's already working on that are locally sourced and very heavily dependent upon local action. Uh, as much as this pains me to say, we have the Boston model that we can uh, pay very close attention to, uh, Climate Ready Boston, which shows how to do this right. A uh, combination of better building codes, shoreline defenses like berms and living shorelines, elevating and hardening public structures and services, creating salt marshes and other places for water to go, construction of green infrastructure to store water, and generally adapting an architecture of accommodation. And there are five principles, only there are five principles for Climate Ready Boston are every project should generate multiple benefits. We should incorporate local involvement in decision making and design. And we should create layers of protection by working at multiple scales. Now, I spent 10 years working for the New York State DEC uh, in the 90s. I understand the challenges of effective community participation, but I also understand that you can't get it right in government if you're not going to go there. And so we are very sobered by the challenge we have in front of us, and we are absolutely committed to being part of an effort to use Intro 1620 to engage communities to put those closest to the challenge, closest to the design and implementation of the solution which I think will also get you better opportunities for funding because you'll have more advocates standing up for the funding we so desperately need. Thank you very much for giving me this chance to testify. Thank you. Karen. Thank you, council members. Uh, my name is Karen Imus. I'm the senior program director at the Waterfront Alliance. Uh, we're a civic organization and coalition of more than 1,100 community, environmental, recreational groups, educational institutions, and other stakeholders. And our mission is to inspire and enable resilient, revitalized, and accessible coastlines for all communities. Uh, earlier this year, we convened a uh, regional resilience task force comprised of more than 300 stakeholders from the public and private sectors ranging from grassroots community groups, to engineers, and financial services, government agencies, charged with building consensus and forming a 2020 campaign to adapt New York and New Jersey to sea level rise and coastal storms. And uh, these are some of the things that we're hearing. Um, as we face climate change and increasing flood risk, we are simultaneously amidst an affordable housing crisis uh, and increased demand for space in our city. Much of our infrastructure is under stress and underfunded. And as we've heard today, significant portions of areas like Coney Island, the Rockaways, Red Hook, Howard Beach, East Harlem, Port Morris, Throgs Neck, uh, many of which are predominantly low to moderate income communities and communities of color, are projected to be underwater on a regular basis before the end of the century, and they face disproportionate risk and social vulnerability. And coupled with that, we know the current value of properties within the floodplain is projected to rise to a staggering $101 billion in fiscal year 2020 which is an increase of 73% from fiscal year 2010. So clearly the demands that we're facing in New York, uh, New York's waterfront communities today are drastically different from 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And that's why a comprehensive lens like intro 1620 has never been more important. While some areas of New York City currently have adaptation or resiliency plans and have held extensive public processes, others are greatly lacking in that regard. And we urge support for Intro 1620. We recently circulated a, a memo of support signed by 15 partner organizations advocating for more robust and equitable climate adaptation. With respect to Intro 1620, we encourage a, a fuller understanding and a conversation about the trade-offs involved in resiliency planning and a, and a robust community engagement uh, uh, process. And we really think this bill could serve a hugely important um, um, role in that regard. And here are a couple of uh, just recommendations to consider 
um, uh, in, in, in including when thinking about this le legislation that is obviously informed by the New York City panel on climate change findings and this new projections and plans are developed that we look at clarifying the agencies responsible for key fun functions of resiliency governance, which is a, a tremendous uh, challenge in, in this particular area, that, that this kind of planning is adequately funded in the budget and that we recognize that it will take resources to ensure a sound community-based engagement process, um, that we prioritize low-income communities and communities of color in an equitable planning process and investment strategy that we build off existing community-based and citywide uh, plans that have done some work in this regard, that we're clear up front about the limitations and possibilities for resiliency in different areas, uh, recognizing where green infrastructure might make more sense, where relocation might make more sense. Importantly, that we look at a more comprehensive approach to rezoning based on the multiple challenges and opportunities facing the city. That that this kind of plan can better position the city to prepare for and respond quickly to federal funding opportunities as they arise. And also importantly, that this plan can help identify opportunities to incorporate resiliency into more general maintenance and capital projects such as road replacement or bulkhead repair. And that we develop clear, accessible, and equitable targets for risk reduction, the number of people at risk of flooding, the number of people with low adaptive capacity living in the floodplain, and so as we work to reduce greenhouse gases and mitigate climate change in partnership with and support of the state of New York's historic climate change legislation, we must ensure that our coastal communities are wisely and resolutely prepared for the reality of sea level rise and the big storm and strongly encourage um, the passage of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, Good to see you again. Um, thanks for having us here. Um, as Paul mentioned, I'm Jessica Roth. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Engagement at Riverkeeper, and we really appreciate uh, the Council's efforts on these bills in particular, but as our ongoing partners in this work, we've, been, we've had great um, relationships working on a lot of really important things. Um, as Paul sort of left off, you know, we think that community representation and participation So, as I was saying, hi, Jessica Roth, Director of Advocacy and Engagement, Riverkeeper. Um, we really think that the community representation and engagement in this process is super important. Uh, it has to be transparent and ongoing, and it has to prioritize the voices of frontline, low-lying, and communities of color. Um, and we really want to make sure that whatever happens moving forward, that's the, the, that process fully incorporates those voices, and that's one of the things that we really appreciate about the opportunity to have a comprehensive, package like uh, of issues being addressed in, like you're doing in 1620. Um, it also has to involve the community resilience work and support that is ongoing, uh, which brings me to the comments that uh, Director Pavishi made. This, I'm, this is off script. This is different from what you have in front of you, but uh, what she said just really requires response. The, the idea that we're waiting for the New York, New Jersey hat study to come out is horrifying on um, so many different levels. But I say that as an individual who lives off the Gowanus Canal and who spent a lot of time doing, respo doing uh, response work after Sandy and having seen a lot of this you know, firsthand. Um, but at organizationally, we have an enormous amount of problems with uh, the process, which does not do any of the things that I mentioned before, which are incorporating in really voices of the people that matter. Um, the outreach and engagement of the Corps has been atrocious. Uh, they are slowly building from their high point when they told me they had 740 emails they sent out and they were very proud of it. So um, there you go. Um, aside from that, uh, as we've discussed a little bit here before, uh, they are not fully incorporating in sea level rise. They talk about this issue over and over and over again. For anyone who is unaware though, this study is being done through the authorization of a statute that came out in the 50s when we were not actually talking about sea level rise and climate change. So it is inherently flawed from the beginning and the way that it's being incorporated by building in bigger um, foundations to barriers and things like that does not actually get to the core issue of ongoing actual sea level rise and sunny day flooding and what is going to become a requirement to keep those gates closed all the time if we're going to be protected from sea level rise. So. Uh, we really appreciate, again, the comprehensive nature of 1620 and looking at all of these pieces from community perspectives and a whole entity of the city and the region. Um, we also, uh, and to do it in a thorough and 
mindful way, which is really important. We all understand and feel the urgency of this, but the fact that the administration is actually advocating for accelerating the HAT study when the big when big problems involved in it already are a lack of real scientific study, although the administration again cited that as a truth to the study. The scientific studies are currently being done, they're not actually currently being done, they are currently reading and studying studies that exist. Once they have already eliminated all of their choices and are only down to one, then they will actually do on-site scientific studies, which is why it fails to incorporate in real impacts to ecosystem services or any of the environmental impacts in a way that will be comprehensive and, and really address uh, the reality of also the living functionality of the Hudson River um, and the rest of the water system around us and how it plays into our other issues of uh, green infrastructure and, and water services and, um, and our, our sewage system and toxins and all of those other issues. So there's a number of reasons why this is incredibly problematic. Um, instead, we really appreciate 1620. <laughs> we like what you guys are doing. Um, we think it's really important to figure out what the ways to move forward are that are adaptive and have multiple benefits. Uh, we look, as um, Paul mentioned earlier, to, to what has happened as a transition um, among the Dutch when they began building their ser early series of dams and barriers in 1953. Um, they had very strict, you know, very set ways that they were going about things, and they went to go and do um, uh, an upgrade about five years ago, and the manager of the program, uh, Arnaud Molinar, said that um, before they were viewing water as a problem, and they focused on how to prevent it from coming in, and New York City had been focusing on evac evacuation and how to get people out of the way, and the key is to figure out what's in between those two places, and how do we actually work with the water and live with the water. Um, uh, Mitch Waxman, who's a historian for the Newtown Creek Alliance, has said, has talked about creating oceanside topography that breaks up wave action, um, doing things like uh, capturing the energy of the storm and actually being able to then use that moving forward, as opposed to building giant walls to block things. I'm going to go really quickly through a couple more things. Um, one of the ways that we can do that is offshore wind, which is actually something that we're in the process of, and we need to be moving that to be part of the conversation around what is resiliency and adaptation in our five borough plan as well. Um, for folks who are unaware, offshore wind, uh, based on studies from the University of Delaware, can actually provide up to a 30% reduction in precipitation, decrease storm surge by up to 79%, and, rec and reduce peak wind speeds by up to 92 miles per hour. And that can happen in just nine years and, 15, and, and a $15 billion price tag, not the full amount. Those are the highest levels, right, based on numbers of, of turbines that are coming. Um, but these are real things that we need to be looking at because this is also then stopping our reliance on fossil fuels, cutting down on, on carbon emissions, so we're actually dealing with the problem of what is creating climate change and throwing adaptation at the process and creating energy. So these are the kinds of things that we have this opportunity to do with 1620, to look at how we can you know, answer lots of different questions at once when everyone is in the conversation at the right way. So I just want to close by saying that we really appreciate, again, the opportunity to be here, this intro. We also really support um, 1480 and um, 382, right? 382, sorry, there's a lot of numbers. And, uh, and would love to have, obviously, ongoing conversations if you have questions, and look forward to working with you all in partnership moving forward. Uh, so I guess the question I'll ask you, everyone at the panel here, is the same question that I asked the administration before that I let off with after I got upset about them not uh, having construction, uh, constructive criticism of the bills. Um, it's, do you believe that we're ready? If a storm were to hit tomorrow, uh, do you believe that New York City is ready to deal with the impacts of a, another storm on the level of Sandy? Yeah, I'll defer to the scientists to start and then go from there. <laughs> We are more ready than we were before Hurricane Sandy. Absolutely, for sure, that is the case. As has been pointed out by Philip and others, complete protection is impossible. We need to, but we are working absolutely concertedly to improve. And that's what we have to keep doing for decades. Thank you. Yeah, I wouldn't say anything that deviates a lot from that, just a little more detail out, and I was, I anticipated this question, so I thought about it a bit before. I mean, in terms of infrastructure, critical infrastructure, a lot is going to be protected. It might be less than 50%, I don't know, I can't tell you an exact number, but a lot more has obviously been protected, right? MTA, Con Ed, things that Janie spoke of earlier. When it comes to neighborhoods, it's a much lower than 50% number, right? It, and it's much larger scale problem where you need to spend tens of billions of dollars if you were going to 
protect neighborhoods from the next sand. Um, so, so that's it. You know, there's a lot of things happening. Uh, a lot of things have been done, but but we're there would be a a great deal more to do to protect people's individual homes. And not much has been done to, to protect them. Well, we weren't ready to protect Fourth Avenue in Brooklyn two plus months ago. We're not ready to protect the city from another Sandy. And this is the issue that, as seriously as you take it, you need to take it twice as seriously or three times as seriously. And so we are just starting to get our arms around just how much more needs to be done just to be ready to deal neighborhood by neighborhood, let alone on a citywide basis. And to add to what folks are saying, I'll also say that um, after Sandy, there was a really big push for like for community, um, you know, door to door engagement, know your neighbors, like the making work like task forces and things like that. And, and for the most part, that's all gone away. Um, and quite frankly, you know, again, like I said, I was actually out in, in Rockaway like two days after Sandy, um, eight days before the Department of Health, you know, knocking on doors to work on providing uh, health needs to people. And that is, I think, also a piece of this that needs to be included in this legislation is the building infrastructure and having resources for the, for the people power that is required to bolster um, the hardware that we're building since I'm certainly not a hardware expert on this. I have one more follow-up point, and that, and that is I, I heard and I often hear that Sandy now, because media oversimplifies and misquotes scientific articles in the scariest way possible a lot of the time. Somebody said that it was a one in 25 year flood for Sandy, and, and NPCC, one of our conclusions is that we don't know, we've seen no evidence, no strong evidence that Sandy was caused by climate change. We know that the sea level rise contributed to it being about 16% more um, damage, and that's a publication that we're hoping to come out with. And about 100,000 more people were flooded because of the sea level rise effect. But it wasn't a climate change event we don't see, that we know of, you know, in terms of that left turn, et cetera. And, and it, you know, we still, there's an asterisk after everything I say. We don't know that, we can't prove that it's not, that it didn't make its left turn because of climate change, but there hasn't been evidence showing that it is. So, and, and any quote that says it's a 25 year return period, I would disagree with. It, it was the biggest flood in the city's history, and FEMA and the, the Corps of Engineers' latest studies have said it's like about a one, once in a hundred year flood. So, I mean, that may be a little optimism there. It's not quite so likely to happen again in the near future. I'm sorry, can I just add one more thing, which is to say that the new work that was happening around that after Sandy has largely gone by the wayside, but there is a lot of that work happening organically and has been happening for decades in communities. That work needs to be supported by the government and by other organizations, and it needs to be increased in the places where it was not happening or where there was like a brief, you know, splash in the, in the thing, and then there, and then it went away. Yeah, I would echo the sentiments. I mean, some progress has been made, but obviously, in addition to physical gaps, there's still big governance gaps and decision-making processes that even years after Sandy are still in flux, just as one example on the land use and zoning side. Department of City Planning is going to put its zoning for coastal resiliency through ULERP probably in 2020. Um, this is a key mechanism by which, just take a step back, I mean, over these several years, zoning changes have been put in place or different measures have been put in place, but nothing has been codified in the way. So it's been seven years on, and now here's the time where DCP is gonna look to do zoning for coastal resiliency. And so here's a huge uh, mechanism where many things like wetlands and living shorelines and how public access lives with coastal resiliency, here's a huge opportunity to look at that. Um, and so clearly, um, yes, we're better prepared, but there are these opportunities like this right in front of us. And I would just add one more thing about the land use zoning piece is that a lot of the waterfront property is not public property, it's privately owned. And so while the city and the state and the federal government can you know, take on the, the big infrastructure uh, projects, we, we still have um, you know, waterfront developments or waterfront projects that are, that are private that have to put certain resiliency measures, measures into place um, based on land use requirements, but what are those requirements, right? Are they, are they sufficient? What does the community, to your point, have to say about what that waterfront is gonna look like in their community? So um, again, progress has been made, certainly on the land use and zoning side, there are opportunities to do a lot more. And if I could just speak for one community that doesn't have a traditional voice, uh, 
we've had a lot of improvements in water quality in our area since the Clean Water Act uh, 45 years ago. Uh, and this uh, idea for the barriers would place many of them at risk by trapping pollutants inside the barriers. But shockingly and disappointingly, while water quality has improved, 11 of our 13 key species of fish in the Hudson Estuary are in deep decline and have not been brought into better health by this improved water quality. These gates would reduce tidal flow. They would reduce the range of the tide, the intensity of the tide. They would change the exchange of sediments, and they would put at risk our efforts to maintain a viable and a more and more healthy ecosystem. And that's the sort of research that uh, my colleague Jessica Roth, I think, was in part referring to when she said that we don't have the information we need to have on the ecological effects these barriers would have. Well, that was my next question to the panel about storm barriers, right? It's like these, there seems to be lots of different challenges relating to CSO, discharge mixing, oxygenation, um, you know, ecosystems. I mean, what, are the, what would the storm, sur storm barriers mean um, for all of those? And, and what else could we do? Like what sort of, if, if in, in place of these storm barriers, what are the types of, of projects that we need to be thinking about in the long term that sort of deal with storm surge and sea level rise equally and, and protect, you know, and I'll, and I'll call for my, my, my t we're not gonna 100% protect communities, but more protection than, um, you know, 100% protection. So this reminds me of when in the 90s, New York City was facing a mandate from the EPA that it spend $10 billion on filtration for its drinking water supply upstate. And rather than spend $10 billion on this massive one-size-fits-all solution, the city and EPA, Riverkeeper, the upstate communities all arranged for a multi-level approach. Some of it was protecting land around the reservoir. Some of it was improving infrastructure in these communities. Some was trying to create some green jobs so these people in the communities upstate could have viable economic opportunities. And they avoided the need to do filtration and save billions. And they took this multi-pronged approach. And by doing so, and I alluded to many of the things that Climate Ready Boston is talking about, better building codes, shoreline defenses like berms and living shorelines, elevating and hardening public structures, creating salt marshes and other places for the water to go, green infrastructure. And as um, Ms. Rob also alluded to, if you focus on uh, making your buildings more resilient, at the same time you can focus on making them more energy efficient and deriving their energy from distributed uh, renewables and uh, uh, achieve synergies there. So you could conceivably use this terrible need as an opportunity as well to solve some of our mitigation challenges. Uh, there's probably been more, in the NPCC meetings, there was probably more heated discussion on the barriers than anything else. Um, and as what you can find, even starting with the first NPCC report, um, uh, we, the NPCC calls for considerable more stu cons considerable further study because of the issues that have been raised here on the panel. Um, first of all, on the science issues, the just the the actual, and uh, and uh, Philip can can make a it has a list of just on the tidal aspects, uh, the physical, the wave action, all of that. Just that's just on the physical part. But because of the issues related first to the social aspects about protecting which neighborhoods are going to be protected, which will not, um, and the ecolo ecology, the ecological aspects, um, those, um, uh, we, what NPCC has, has repeatedly come out with in its report is, uh, in its consensus report, is absolute more study on it. Um, um, just to say that the portfolio approach, what the NPCC does bring forward is very much the need, as I think we've, we can see in the discussion this afternoon, of 
um, a portfolio approach to resilience. It's there's never just one silver bullet that's going to save everything. And that's really what I believe we, you know, the, the entire New York City uh, uh, community is really bringing forward. So the regulations, the ins insurance is one, the program, programmatically. The second is social programs, like the cohesion, um, uh, the sa building the neighbor, building whatever we can do to build the neighborhoods and get ready with the buddy system, for example, et cetera. Then ecological um, with the green infrastructure. And then finally, engineering. Engineering, of course, plays a role. But with the big, it is the biggest uh, ticket item in terms of uh, potential uh, engineering resilience projects. And in order to embark on that um, with its considerable costs, um, what, what the NPCC recommends is more studies on it before it's undertaken. Also, I would just say that, I mean, we've clearly established our opposition to these giant and water barriers, but I mean, it really concerns me that the, that the way that the Corps is talking about the secondary measures and the onshore things um, is sort of an afterthought, sort of to the point that you were just making about the silver bullet of the one big answer. Like, what are the, what are the small stopgap measures that they're talking about when they're really viewing their big barriers as the primary solution? Um, and they're not, there's been very little discussion of that. In fact, those, the real, real discussion around onshore measures being supplemental to the in-water barriers has only happened in the last two to three meetings that they've had. And trust me, I have been to like 10 of their meetings, <laughs> like almost all of them. And it's only been in the most recent past that they've even started talking about it quite frankly in response to us challenging them over and over and over again that they're not dealing with sea level rise. And you know, I mean, Bryce almost jumped out of his skin last time when I said it when I'm sitting next to him up here. So, I mean, these are real concerns that, um, and because of the fact that they are doing such a poor job at the community engagement level, to be looking at localized uh, solutions to local problems is not, that's not what they do, right? Like, that's just not how they operate. And so I think that's really where the city council strength comes in, is being, you know, represented uh, representative of and connected to the communities that you all actually live in and are representing and then have power to, you know, work with. So, you know, I've had numerous conversations with them where I've said things like, you need to be having those conversations around, you know, where is the place that floods when it's not pouring? Because people know that answer and that's going to, that should affect your, you know, I live on that corner, around the corner from that flooding video that we all watched on Fourth Avenue a few months ago. Like, I can tell you that. And that's, that didn't happen during Sandy. Actually, we were dry during Sandy. But that's happened three or four times since I've lived there. And I know that. I'm not an architect. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a scientist. Like, but I know those things. And there's lots of people that know that everywhere. And that's the key um, to building the really proper and resilient measures to, to fulfill all of those, to fit as many of those gaps that we need to fill. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I'm, I'm actually doing research alongside the Corps of Engineers study, so I won't say too many contentious things about the Corps of Engineers and their study, but they are welcoming us to do additional science and evaluate how the flushing of the estuaries would change, et cetera, uh, mainly looking at the Hudson. But one thing I'll say is I think, um, you know, there's several council members who want to see the Jamaica Bay surge barrier built. And, and so, you know, just coming back to that, I, you know, that's something that I anticipate is going to come out as one of the things they recommend. I anticipate they won't come out recommending something across the harbor and across the Hudson, you know, interfering with the Hudson River. Uh, so what's really gonna be contentious will be, and I think supported by lots of people in Jamaica Bay, for better or worse, is building a barrier, uh, a gated surge barrier across the entrance to Jamaica Bay. And it will not stop sea level rise, it will stop storm surges. It will, sea level rise and tidal flooding will gradually increase and, and they'll have to, it'll also have to, the costs and benefits of raising seawalls around various neighborhoods and some of them are very intricately woven with canals and things and, and so that'll be that'll be the where i think the stuff hits the fan in, in the coming uh few years is with jamaica bay and a few other side estuaries that's my hunch but i'll let them speak to the hudson the question about the hudson which is still on the table i want to i want to be mindful of future panels but just i guess to, to wrap up is there any one borough, as far as vulnerabilities, is there any one borough you feel is more vulnerable than the others, um, or are they all equally vulnerable? Well, you saw our maps. It's Queens and, and Brooklyn are definitely a, a much more vulnerable because there's a lot more area 
of former wetland that got that had landfill to where neighborhoods exist right. now. So definitely those are two neighborhoods and in, uh, in terms of area, probably also population. I do want to make an observation that I think at the Army Corps, there's a tremendous willingness to problem solve. I'm sure that's baked into who they are. Their authorization is insufficient. I think they would welcome the authorization to be broadened to truly include this non-storm surge related sea level rise. And I think they also appreciate the validity of a multi-pronged approach that's community by community and I've even seen really thoughtful comments by some of the folks who have been mentioned already in the newspaper saying, if you design for each community, you may not get all of them right, but you're not dependent upon one project succeeding, and if it fails, everybody loses. So I think the core has capacity that they would like to bring to the table. I do agree with Ms. Roth, as a former government official at DEC for 10 years, it's very hard for agencies to do community engagement. Well, you look at the article in Curved about the uh, Lower East Side Coastal Resiliency Program and all of those great community assets like Solar One saying, well, they haven't talked to us or we don't know what's going to happen or we're just trying to guess. That's just not acceptable. So we'll try to help with the community engagement. Let's harness the power that the core and the other agencies could bring to this. But, but one size does not fit all. All right, guys, thank you very, very much. Okay, our next panel uh, is Jalissa Gilmore from Environmental Justice Alliance, David Shuffler from Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice, Summer Sandoval from Uprose, Emily Walker, Helen Cheng, and that's it. So, Jalissa Gilmore, you're here. David Shuffler, are you still in the room? No, he's not here. All right, so he's uh, Summer. You're here, okay. Emily, yep. Helen Chang, are you still in the room? No, sorry, I'm gonna call then uh, Michael McMahon. Are you still in the room? And Sean Slevin. So we can make sure we have a full panel up there and we can get everyone moving as quickly as we can. And again, I, I apologize, but we do have to keep the five minute clock because we are trying to get as many people as we can and it's been a long hearing. Thank you. Okay, so everyone wants to start? You want to start from the left to the right, whatever you want. I'll start. Sure. Good afternoon, I'm Julissa Gilmore and I'm here to testify in support of Intro 1620, the Five Borough Resiliency Plan on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. NIJA and our member organizations coalesce around specific common issues that threaten the ability of low income and communities of color to thrive and coordinate campaigns designed to affect city and state policies, including addressing climate change threats to the resilience of waterfront communities. NIJA member organizations represent environmental justice communities overburdened by flood hazards, proximity to waterfront industrial zones, lack of green and open spaces, air pollution caused by dirty industry clustered in their neighborhoods, and extreme heat events. Therefore, we understand firsthand the urgency of the climate crisis and the need for innovative climate adaptation strategies that can be incorporated into the Five Borough Resiliency Plan. As NIJA's Executive Director, Eddie Bautista, and Council Member Brannon highlighted in today's op-ed, New York City isn't remotely ready for the next superstorm. There has not been nearly enough investment in the low-income communities of color and the outer boroughs where the most vulnerable populations are. We would like to thank Council Member Constance Tenedas um, and Brannon for introducing a plan that aims to protect 
protects all of New York City's boroughs from climate change, sea level rise, and sunny day flooding. There are a few considerations that we would like the City Council and the Mayor's Office of Resiliency to take into account as the plan moves forward. NIJA has long advocated for climate adaptation measures in New York City's industrial waterfront. In 2010, NIJA launched the Waterfront Justice Project and discovered the significant maritime and industrial areas for SMIAs, clusters of heavy industry along the waterfront are all in storm surge zones and in environmental justice communities. When considering how to protect New York City's shoreline, the five borough resiliency plan should consider measures that also protect communities from the cumulative contamination exposure risk associated with clusters of heavy industry uses in vulnerable locations. According to the New York City Panel on Climate Change, New York City is predicted to experience anywhere from 8 to 30 inches of sea level rise by the 2050s. The plan should consider both sea level rise and storm surge zones and storm surge alongside the FEMA flood insurance rate maps when determining the community districts that should be evaluated for climate change resiliency adaptation measures. Several waterfront communities were involved in post-Sandy community planning efforts and have not seen these plans fully implemented. The Five Borough Resiliency Plan should make sure to incorporate the research and community input resulting from processes such as the Hunts Point Resiliency, Eastside Coastal Resiliency, and East Harlem Resiliency. The plan should ensure that there is extensive community engagement with the communities that develop these plans. Additionally, we are disappointed in the inequitable investments to date in climate adaptation and resiliency. For example, during the Hunts Point's resiliency process, the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center only received a few million for a feasibility study, yet Mayor de Blasio has committed 10 billion for protecting Lower Manhattan. The community and local stakeholders explicitly ask for coastal resiliency, and while the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and NYC EDC made promises there have been no real commitments. New York City government has not committed to equ equitably protecting waterfront communities from climate change, and we believe the Five Borough Resiliency Plan is an opportunity to remedy this shortfall. Nija would like to thank the New York City Council for holding this oversight hearing on the seventh anniversary of Super Superstorm Sandy and the, test the opportunity to test Good afternoon, my name is Samra Sandoval and I'm the Energy of Democracy Coordinator at Burroughs. Um, thanks for the opportunity to testify here on the seventh anniversary of Superstorm Sandy. Um, and on behalf of Burroughs, we're here to express our support for intro 1620, um, the Five Borough Resiliency Plan. So in 1966, Burroughs is Brooklyn's oldest Latino um, community-based organization. We are an intergenerational um, and multiracial and nationally recognized organization that works on um, resiliency, sustainability, and Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Um, we focus all our work on climate justice and all of our work is rooted on the just transition model as seen as um, in our leadership with developing the first community-owned um, solar project in New York. Um, so as we've heard today, many of us, um, Super Sand Sandy was a wake-up call um, for New York City to really focus on climate change. But it seems too soon after the fact that um, the post-devastation -de concern has dwindled to a secondary thought. And as recognized today, that there's still so much to be done with engagement um, and with investment, intentional investment, to really address um, coastal resiliency and, equi um, and equity in the city. Um, so as mentioned by Jalisa, Sunset Park um, is New York City's largest significant maritime and industrial area. It has 14 million square feet of industrial space. And you know, for many New Yorkers, climate change is still a really scary reality. So it's time that we utilize that industrial space and build with um, the support of, with the political will and support, we can finally use this space to build for climate adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. Um, earlier this year, Uprose partnered with the Collective for Community, Culture, and the Environment to develop a community-informed proposal for Sunset Park called the Green Resilient Industrial District, or the GRID. And the GRID is a holistic vision that plans for 
both existing and long-term um, impacts, climate impacts for Sunset Park. The grid outlines the process of how we are going to move from an extractive economy dependent on fossil fuels to um, a green industrial economy that trains local residents for renewable energy, green retrofit, and climate jobs, all while promoting equity. The grid is aligned with and operationalizes plans since, such as the Sunset Park Brownfield Opportunity Area, um, New York City Climate Mobilization Act, and the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. A Sunset Park grid has the opportunity to catalyze not only local but regional climate engagement in eco-industrial jobs, green ports, sustainable manufacturing, and food security, which would create a truly climate adapt, um, adaptation economy. But some of the challenges that not only Sunset Park, but other significant maritime industrial areas in New York City faces um, is gentrification. And so contrary to the grid, developers such as Jamestown Properties have invaded Sunset Park's industrial waterfront with luxury, commercial, and retail uses in the form of Industry City. Energy City's rezoning proposal is not only disrupting social cohesion and eliminating, eliminating well-paid working class jobs, but also prevents us from moving forward with utilizing the industrial waterfront spaces to prepare and build for the um, risk of climate change. Uprose, as steering committee members of New York Renews, were part of passing the monumental climate le legislation, the CLCPA, earlier this year that really lays the groundwork for addressing climate change and climate justice issues. The grid is a vision for climate jobs and coastal resiliency that can be realized by funding through the CLCPA and in the future by the Green New Deal. The grid is a perfect example of how frontline communities have the climate solutions that meet all of their needs. It is both a report, proposal, and process that honors community-based planning and should be used as a model. Um, to also answers the question that was posed many times today was, is, are we ready for another Sandy if it hit tomorrow? And the answer is absolutely not. We are not because the city is only as strong as the most vulnerable communities. And if a Sandy hit tomorrow, still thousands of people would be displaced. Many people might die. And we, there actually, I'm even bold enough to say that we are worse off than we were pre-Sandy, not diminishing any of the work and investment that has gone to resiliency, but one, we climate impacts have worsened at a rate faster than investments have gone into resiliency, especially with front into frontline communities. And two, as mentioned today, we're still dealing with um, post Sandy recovery seven years later. Um, so, with that said, I just want to thank the council for holding this hearing. And for more information, please see us. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Walker and I'm the Director of Outreach and Programs at New Yorkers for Parks. I would like to thank the City Council Committees on Resiliency and Waterfronts and Environmental Protection for holding this important hearing today. On this day, the seventh anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, we believe the conversation about a citywide resiliency plan is of urgent importance. Additionally, with multiple resiliency projects in the pipeline now, we see a need for the city to plan for a comprehensive approach to protect the vulnerable coastline and waterfronts of the five boroughs. We therefore support the proposed intro 1620, which would require a semi-regular citywide comprehensive planning project process for our entire shoreline. As evidenced by Sandy, water impacted all five boroughs of this city. We acknowledge that the city has had to move forward with some expediency to initiate vitally needed resiliency projects in lower Manhattan, but we also know water doesn't discriminate and that the other stretches of our waterfront will require similar projects in the not too distant future. We are concerned that the current resiliency plans moving forward in Lower Manhattan are being done with a piecemeal approach. This will mean that significant stretches of the waterfront will be closed for renovation and reconstruction at overlapping intervals, with a variety of city agencies overseeing these disparate projects. While those in the know are perhaps aware of these jurisdictional boundaries of these spaces, to the average New Yorker, they are simply waterfront parks and esplanades that will soon be taken offline for a number of years. We do not feel there has been sufficient interagency coordination of these projects so far, and we really hope that um, Intro 1620 would help address this issue moving forward for all resiliency projects. Making our waterfront and coastline more resilient um, will also require a process to allow the public to provide input on any projects that move forward. Many, in a, many of our waterfront neighborhoods are also frontline communities that are most vulnerable to climate change and long-term environmental justice issues. Engaging these New Yorkers early and often in any citywide resiliency planning will be key to getting it done right. 
we suggest that the city create a task force with five borough representation to help ensure that any future citywide resiliency planning is done in coordination with the New Yorkers who represent these communities which stand to be most impacted by climate change. We would also ask the council to consider the funding needed to truly implement a citywide resiliency plan for our waterfront. The cost of the important Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project alone is projected to be over $1.4 billion. This is a tremendous amount of funding for just one small piece of our waterfront. And we have questions. Will OMB fund these efforts in a five borough strategy or will specific agencies be responsible for the funding needed to implement these projects moving forward? We believe this is an issue of equity and significant funding must be allocated for the citywide resiliency projects that we know will be necessary to protect our coastal communities. New Yorkers for Parks and the Municipal Arts Society recently co-authored a report called Bright Ideas in which we call for New York City to create a position for a director of the public realm. Having this ombudsman type role carved out to ensure that citywide development and planning happens in a thoughtful, equitable way would go a long way toward improving the efficacy of a proposal such as the one we are discussing today. A five borough resiliency plan will um, require a truly comprehensive strategy and we suggest that the city take seriously to the suggestion to create a role for this. Finally, one of New York Rister Parks' weightiest concerns is always relating to public open space and parks will be the question of long-term maintenance. For too long, New York City has failed to dedicate permanent and meaningful funding for baseline year-round maintenance and operations staff lines. While we were encouraged by the investments made by the city in the FY20 budget, we know many of those positions are still not permanent and will not meet the sum of tremendous needs of our park system. As we contemplate a citywide resiliency plan for our waterfront and coastline spaces, we must also plan for the baseline maintenance positions that will be needed to keep them to the highest standard of care. Simply put, maintenance is a matter of protecting our capital investments, and we think any conversation about what will be billions of dollars in construction is a non-starter without an appropriate permanent commitment to more full-time maintenance and operations staff to help maintain these important public spaces. We also want to note that these would be permanent green jobs. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I welcome any questions you may have. I'd like to address something that hasn't been brought to the attention of the Council thus far, and it relates to perhaps our most important assets here in the city, that's our families. So I'd like to bring that to you in the realm of the importance of dry side water safety training. Did you know that every second a person dies due to drowning? And that for every death, five more people are suffering life-altering brain and spinal cord injuries, changing the direction of their lives forever. Drownings and water-based accidents are a global epidemic. And while those statistics are so disturbing, perhaps the most shocking of all is that 95% of those tragedies absolutely never had to happen. They were totally preventable. Here in New York City, our waterfronts are being developed as never before in our lifetimes, opening up the water access dramatically. This open access is fabulous for that person who understands that environment and has the skills to successfully navigate it. But for every one of those people, there are hundreds of thousands more that do not know the environment and don't have those skills. So as a result, our drownings and water-based accidents will skyrocket. In addition, we are being dramatically impacted, as we've all discussed here this afternoon, by our water levels, which are rising on average an inch per year. So in 30 years' time, we will have a sandy event every day at high tide. Our super storms are getting more super, not less. So how do we address this? Certainly, city government is addressing our hard assets, our land and our building issues, but nothing is done thus far to protect our most important assets, our families. Our families need to understand that water safety and swimming skills are as important as buckling up your seatbelt 
when you get into an automobile. That indeed, it's not one solution, but a multi-layered solution that's needed to bring New York City Family of Products IQ up to a level of safety. Some of those solutions are quite simple. Better signage and access points to the water, use of technology to push water conditions to our cell phones, lifeguards on the beaches longer, media campaigns on public transportation, and social media, billboards around the city, helping to make swimming lessons more accessible and affordable. But what I want to address here today specifically is education through dry side water safety training. On a practical basis, we understand not everybody is going to be able to learn to swim. However, everyone can learn about the dangers that water represents to us inside our own homes and everywhere that we meet it in the great out of doors. And I also want you to understand that water safety is not just a summer conversation. Here we are in the middle of fall, hurricane season. We lost three of our youth just this month alone. Two in the Rockaways, one in the Hudson. Why? because the water temperatures are still warm and air condition is still warm as well, attracting people to open water settings and sometimes, as we've just seen, with terrible results. So water safety training will absolutely help people understand the different environments that they are meeting water in and therefore they will be able to make decisions that keep them safe in and around the water. For example, drowning is a leading cause of death for children ages five and younger, and most of those children are dying in their own homes. The first thing that may come to your mind is, oh, that's outdoor, your, your backyard swimming pool, it's not properly secured. Well, yes, that's one reason, but inside our own homes, bathtubs clearly are a significant risk. It's actually our distracted parents that are the risk. But who? has thought about the fact that our toilet bowls are such attraction to our young toddlers. Who knew it could be so much fun to throw your toy in the toilet and then go in and retrieve it? A toddler's head is the heaviest part of their body. If they are upended and no one sees them, two inches, two minutes, that's all it takes for any of us to drown. So clearly we need to be able to waterproof our homes and that concept has to be brought out into the outdoors as well. I'll finish up very quickly. Drowning disproportionately impacts children of color. The statistics show that drowning is the second leading cause of death for children 14 and younger, with children of color drowning five times more um, frequently in swimming pools, three times more frequently in open water settings than their Caucasian peers. And it's not just a problem with young children. Drowning is the second leading cause, I'm sorry, drowning is the leading cause of death for children on the spectrum. And drowning affects males 80% to females 20% from mid-teens into mid-30s. So the teaching of water safety in all schools, public Could and Could you please private, wrap up? Thank you. Is one of the best layers of protection that we can provide to our families. And therefore, I'm asking that you please do consider not just the hard asset infrastructure here in New York City, but also the protection of our families through teaching the awareness of water safety and the importance of it. Thank you very much for allowing me to testify. Good afternoon. <coughs> My name is Mike McCann. I am from the Nature Conservancy. So thank you, Chairperson Brandon, Chairperson Constantinides, for this opportunity to uh, offer some testimony. Um, I'm offering testimony on behalf of the Nature Conservancy. We're the world's largest conservation organization. We have over 600 scientists. We work in all 50 states and over 70 different countries across the globe. So I'm going to try to condense my testimony since we've all been here a while. I'm going to cut to the chase because I think we all agree that you know, we have to figure out, as a city, how we're going to adapt to a future with more water. So I'm offering my testimony today in support of Intro 1620, which calls for a comprehensive five-borough resiliency plan. 
We encourage the committees to advance legislation that adapts to a future with more water with an array of approaches, including strategic relocation, non-structural measures, and nature-based solutions. Plans to adapt our built environment must also be complemented by efforts to increase community resiliency through enhanced social cohesion and disaster preparedness to an array of hazards. There's no one-size-fits-all approach for how communities will adapt to a changing climate, and this is true for New York City shoreline neighborhoods. We are encouraged to see that the legislation will, will require a plan to consider an array of approaches. Hardening our shorelines with seawalls and breakwaters only buys us time to adapt our ways of life. Built defenses will eventually be overtopped by rising seas and larger storms. Therefore, we must limit new development in our floodplains where possible. We believe that for some of the most low-lying areas where sunny day flooding is already a problem, the long-term solution is for communities to make the voluntary decision to relocate to higher, safer ground and to allow nature to return to act as a buffer between water and their, our communities. Strategic relocation or managed retreat is complicated and will not be easy, but is better than an unmanaged retreat from our coast where people leave their communities and leave their homes without a plan and without support. Measures must be put in place to ensure that the proposed solutions do not lead to unintended consequences such as the inequitable displacement of environmental justice communities, low income, elderly, recent immigrant, and other vulnerable populations. In cases where built structures, the hard and soft stabilization methods, where they're the chosen approach, a hybrid design that combines both green and gray elements can be a cost-effective means to deliver flood protection. For example, we can combine marshes and mussel beds along with seawalls and floodgates. The Nature Conservancy's Urban Coastal Resilience Report demonstrated that a hybrid system in the community of, o of Howard Beach, Queens, could mitigate nearly a quarter billion dollars of damages for a 100-year storm event. So we support Intro 1620, and we would like to offer ways to improve legislation. A comprehensive plan for the future of our shorelines will impact the lives of people and must be shaped by community voices. Meaningful stakeholder engagement efforts must be a part of these planning efforts and a new comprehensive plan must respect the community-based planning that has already occurred in communities such as Hunts Point, the Lower East Side, and elsewhere. Second, built elements, whether they're green, gray, or hybrid, such as beach, beach nourishment, sea walls, living shorelines, and salt marshes, are only one component of climate adaptation. A truly comprehensive plan will enhance social cohesion and improve governance to create community resilience and disaster preparedness. Third, the planning efforts should extend beyond the current special flood hazard area, and they must consider the future floodplains as predicted by the New York City Panel on Climate Change. As we've seen from our experts today, we must plan for the range of possibilities and that uncertainty when it comes to the storms and sea level rise that we might expect in 2050 or 2100. Regarding the scope of the legislation, it is unclear why only residential buildings, not more than three stories in height, are considered. This is a question that we have about this legislation because residential buildings of all sizes, commercial and industrial use buildings, are all obviously vulnerable. Next, a comprehensive plan to adapt to flooding will also consider the effects of more frequent heavy rains, as been brought up a number of times in today's hearing, um, and how these flood events can impact the inland neighborhoods, not just our shoreline community districts, and how this can exacerbate the storm surges in the coastal areas. And finally, living with more water is only one reality of a changing climate. A multi-hazard approach will benefit the efficacy of these planning efforts, and efforts to adapt our shoreline to flooding should integrate with efforts to manage heat, winter storms, and other hazards. So to wrap up, climate change is a dire threat. I think we all recognize that. But in some ways, this is also an opportunity. It is a chance for our New Yorkers. These are some of the brightest minds in the country, in the world to really envision a brighter future. It's an opportunity for communities to create safe neighborhoods, to build social cohesion, and create an equitable future. And it's an opportunity to build a city where people and nature can thrive. So the Nature Conservancy would like to offer our support and collaboration in advancing those efforts. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I think we have one more panel.
Um, whoever is still here, please come up. Uh, Hunter Armstrong, Caroline Caroline Nagy, or Nagy, uh, Georgie Page Smith, Joel Kumperman, Lucy Coteen. That's it. Okay. You can start whenever you're ready. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Caroline Nagy, and I'm Deputy Director for Policy and Research at the Center of New York City Neighborhoods. I'd like to thank um, the chairs and members and staff of the um, Environmental Protection and Resiliency and Waterfront Committee for holding today's hearing. I'm not going to read my testimony. Um, I will say that the Center for New York City Neighborhoods works to promote and protect affordable home ownership in New York City so that middle and working class families are able to live in strong, thriving communities. And I would like to just basically um, summarize our work. Um, we have been working with homeowners impacted, specifically low and moderate income homeowners um, since you know Sandy first struck. And we've uh, partnered with uh, um, New York City um, and government and city council since the beginning. So um, I want to talk a bit about what we have to offer for homeowners in flood prone areas today. Uh, flood help and what FloodHelpNY.org is a first-of-its-kind web platform that engages and informs homeowners on how they can protect their homes from rising sea levels and how to lower their flood insurance rates. Um, through that uh, platform, we also offer home resiliency counseling and home resiliency audits, um, some of which can save homeowners money immediately because many homeowners receiving so-called subsidized flood insurance rates are actually paying more than they would if they paid a flood insurance rate based on their actual elevation. Um, so it's a very important resource, and um, you know, city council members have been really wonderful partners along with the de Blasio administration in getting the word out about that. Um, we are also about to begin installing backwater bu valves in basements in flood-prone areas um, to prevent sewer backflow during a flood or heavy rain event. And as always, we offer foreclosure prevention and homeowner stabilization services for homeowners at risk of displacement due to foreclosure, tax liens, or other kinds of reverse mortgages or other issues. So on um, intro 382, we um, you know, support sending outreach to homeowners. Um, everyone should know about uh, flood insurance. Um, one letter is simply um, insufficient uh, for um, really getting the word out there. What we found through our experience in working with homeowners is it's not even just one touch. Because if you're telling people that they need to make really dramatic changes to their homes, to their financing for their future, you know, that's really more than a letter. You know, this kind of a, a broad community education, outreach, and organizing effort, including um, individualized services like resiliency counseling. Um, so in addition to sending a letter to everyone in the new um, special flood hazard area, we'd also recommend um, contacting everyone who's in the um, newly designated moderate uh, risk zone or X zone. And also, um, why stop at once the, um, maps are adopted because actually people need to lock themselves into lower rates before the new maps are adopted to take advantage of longer term subsidies that will make their housing situation more affordable in the intermediate term. We're also very interested and have been active in NFIP advocacy at the federal level. Um, and then the um, other um, bill that I wanted to just comment on very briefly is 1620. Of course, uh, we need a comprehensive five borough plan um, to combat uh, climate change, sea level rise, and sunny day flooding. Um, we just urge the city to involve community members and organizations in disaster response planning and recovery efforts, giving particular attention to the linguistic and cultural needs of community members, as well as the needs of seniors and people with disabilities. Uh, finally, I want to point out that um, while we are able to make really good recommendations to homeowners uh, looking at their, um, based on their individual situations. The one piece of the puzzle that's missing, um, as far as we're concerned, is affordable financing for um, home resiliency retrofits. Um, we've been looking at a lot of different alternatives. Um, PACE loans are intr intriguing, but have some very serious consumer protection risks that really need to be taken into account before they're adopted for residential lending in New York City. And um, this is a major need and something that we look forward to working with City Council on. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. I had to get to train, so. Hello. 
Thank you for holding this hearing today. My name is Georgie Page. I'm a volunteer for 350 Brooklyn. We work to counter climate change through local action. We promote sustainable energy. We oppose fossil fuel, the fossil fuel industry, and we educate and activate our community. We are a local affiliate of 350.org and we support Intro 1620. I am new to environmental advocacy. My background is as a producer and marketing and communications executive who has done a lot of volunteering. As I prepared for today, I recalled volunteering in the Rockaways after Sandy and witnessing an almost apocalyptic scene, completely unworthy of our city. Um, the federal act uh, planning alone is not enough. We cannot afford to rely solely on federal plans and timelines. The Office of Resiliency director herself said that providing a city plan to the Army Corps of, en Corps of Engineers did not necessarily gain us money, but it did accelerate the timelines, and that's what we need. Um, and I would hope and imagine that a comprehensive plan would help to raise the visibility and accountability of the future federal plan, plan, and especially with the establishment of metrics. Specifically uh, for 350 Brooklyn, uh, we are thrilled for the introduction of a comprehensive plan and hope the city will consider future legislation that looks holistically at other issues, including energy and urban heat island effects. We hope that the action plan for each borough takes into account city and area-wide impacts as each borough is not a standalone system, nor is New York City. From an environmental justice perspective, we encourage the Office of Resiliency to look at how the plans will affect surrounding areas, including our neighboring counties and states in terms of sea level rise, flood and impact on habitat, including the Hudson River. We encourage the consideration of elevation for future rezonings and recommend that for the safety of the citizens of New York and the future of the city, large scale rezonings not be implemented in flood zone A areas, such as Gowanus. We encourage further wetlands restoration, which can absorb water, absorb water over, sea wa over sea walls which displace water to another location. And finally, something I just added, uh, we need to look beyond painting roofs. Um, I attended a panel convened by Representative Clark um, at the Brooklyn Public Library that was called Climate Resilient Smart Cities. She convened an amazing panel. There were some great takeaways. Um, and one of them was that what we're, one of the huge gaps and what we're lacking is um, distributed energy generation, uh, including solar. People need energy for their CPAP machines, for example, uh, when a flood event does happen. Um, other cities have been effective in engaging their citizens in these kinds of programs. Um, lastly, I wanna call out the Renewable Rikers Plan as a piece of the puzzle. Uh, with its increased renewable energy generation and potential to increase sewage treatment capacity. Thank you very much. Um, hi, good evening almost. Uh, my name is Lucy Coteen. I'm neither an expert nor a professional. I'm just your everyday community activist. So I may be somewhat off topic at time, but um, I was looking at this, uh, the proposed local law requires that the Office of Recovery and Resiliency or such agencies the mayor shall designate, shall develop a comprehensive five borough plan to protect the entire shoreline of New York City. So we know that we must adapt to climate change and because of that there exist policies on resiliency and a resiliency and recovery agency and the city council recently declared a climate emergency. Yet we see the opposite put into place in every borough of the city, despite numerous science articles speaking about the reduction in the urban forest across the country, and at the same time articles telling us about the necessity of mature trees as part of the solution in absorbing carbon and excess water, we are seeing large tree removal and earth removal throughout the city, 
and these natural conditions replaced with concrete and asphalt. The climate emergency declared by the city council would have meaning if there were legislation accompanying it that demanded that every project, both land and building projects, had to attach a study that showed how it would be in compliance with the resiliency policy. A project must show how it will benefit animals, birds, and insects, because to do so is to benefit humans. And EIS must be mandatory and not an option. If it finds that an impact cannot be mitigated, as they often do, then the project has to be adjusted until it shows a positive result or withdrawn altogether. We know that humans will have to migrate away from coasts to live, yet we see the Department of City planning approving projects such as the Two Bridges Project, a project that will create a wall along the East River blocking out light, air, views, generate heat, and be filled with many empty apartments. And in the end, we can expect the taxpayers will have to bail out this riverside development when it flooded. There is no doubt that it will flood, as will the southern part of Manhattan. We should have passed a moratorium on building by the water and in the, and in the water years ago. We are no different than Houston, Texas, that replaced the earth and trees with concrete and suffered the consequences of severe flooding twice in two years. Any comprehensive plan must include retreat from the shoreline, managed retreat or strategic relocation, call it what you want, but we have to stop building by the shore. The way to protect the shoreline is with a natural environment to act as a sponge for water and wind absorption. There is no shame in outlawing the building of new structures by the water. Somehow the city seems like this would be embarrassing to say you have to stop building concrete structures by the water. The number one protector against climate change are large trees, yet all over New York City, large trees are being removed from the parks and the shorelines, and street trees are not protected from the rapacious developers that rule the city. Throughout the city, a massive number of large trees are being cut down, and the natural environment is being paved over. There's a wide pattern of abuse of the natural world in contradiction to city policy to increase resiliency and no agency or politician is doing anything to stop it. I refer to the, the resiliency guidelines um, and that the goal of the city to increase tree canopy 30% by 2030. Um, and just, well, how's the time? I'm sorry. Um, a few thoughts of how the council can, prom can promote environmental stewardship. Hold a hearing that addresses the discrepancy between the stated policies and goals of the city and the actual pro projects that are put into place. Enact legislation that demands that any project that alters the environment must go through the, an EIS process and be in compliance with CEQA and show that the project will do no harm to the environment and in fact will conform with the stated policies of the city. They can no longer state that a problem cannot be mitigated. They must find a solution or alter the project, enact legislation and create an agency that will protect the trees and the natural environment that will be act like a warden for the environment. If someone sees damaging being done to a street tree or a park tree, the agency can be contacted and they will immediately send out a tree protector to stop the damage. Tree damage is commonly seen in development areas and in parks and then enact legislation that requires that any study or report undertaken by any agency must be placed on the website of that agency. There must be full transparency in the way that taxpayer money is used by agencies. We shouldn't have to foil or sue an agency to get a report. If parks forestry is removing trees, it should only occur if a tree risk assessment has been performed and that tree is an imminent risk of injuring people or damage or property and utilities. And just, um, have any of you read um, New York 2140 by Kim Stanley Robinson and know about it? Excuse me, Chairman. I just, I just want to, I just want to say, I represent two NYCHA tenant associations. One in 14 people in New York City live in NYCHA housing. I, I, I understand, but I just want to make it real, it's a really important point. We're going to give you Everyone time. Is to, neglected. We're going to give you, the hearing's not over. He just has to step out to okay. something. Okay, I just want to make okay. sure okay. that. Okay. And he's the last speaker. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry to be. So anyway, real quick, 21, New York 2140 talks about New York City in 2140 when all of lower Manhattan is flooded. I think it's a probably pretty accurate picture of what we have to look forward to, or not look forward to actually, 
people are uh, getting around uh, like canals and rafts. Um, anyway, I think we're just what's being discussed and looked at is so short-sighted. We've got to look much bigger. She's uh, before we heard nine and a half feet by 2100. 2100 is right around the corner, folks. So we got to look much bigger than we're looking. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sorry for speaking at it. It's uh, okay. I'm Joel Kupferman, Environmental Justice Initiative in the National Lawyers Guild Environmental Justice Committee. Um, first, it's maybe, I think, is in order is just reciting our mantra is a good law without enforcement is worse than no law. And we take exceptions to these three bills in that um, there's a lot of language that's ambiguous. It should be expanded in terms of, of um, even referring to which federal law is applicable. And we also believe that creating um, this new agency or, um, for flood, flood control uh, might require a city charter uh, change. I think it's important that you look into that. But as I said a few times, that one in 14 people live in NYCHA housing. Um, I represent two um, tenant associations right now. Smith Houses, which is in the eyesight of this building, is undergoing a $56 million rebuild. Hurricane Sandy, besides Hurricane Sandy, was hit by 9-11, so we have, we have the soils there. Over and over again, we've contacted the city, the state, and the feds that the contractor hired to, to rebuild that structure has cut the roots and um, done everything wrong in terms of tree protection and uncovered the soil. So that would have a tree loss there with $56 million contract. In Baruch, they cut down over 200 trees on the grounds being told that there is a, um, a, a blight on, on those trees. That has not been proven. There's another half a billion dollars coming through for just the developments in, in Manhattan. We're having a tree loss at NYCHA and elsewhere, as is indicated here. So I think it's really important that these people be protected in terms of not just the resources, but the natural resources that are there. When those people call 311 for help, partly out of that um, sandy revitalization plan because they were exposed to the soil that had up to 240 parts of arsenic, the health department told them that they're not near, we're not near jurisdiction. So I think it's really important to look at all the health effects of every rebuild action that's there. We talked about the East River Park, of how much soil that's going to be there. That's not being contained, and that basically shows from after 9-11 that it's the dust alone, that particular matter, that's going to hurt everyone that's there. Also in East River Park and elsewhere, we can't believe that the city is using artificial turf as, as a means of, of of ground cover. Um, in their own Parks Department resiliency plans, they said this is a no-no. Why are we allowing this to be used there at Smith with all these, these problems? They want to really re rebuild the ball field, and yet they're still putting in artificial turf. It becomes up to 130 degrees in the summer, so it's definitely an environmental justice problem that the kids can't play on that you know, in the summer, and also PFOAs and other particulates are, and toxics are being emitted from those, um, from those fields. Then we have a problem with resiliency building. At Smith, they're putting up concrete barriers that be put into place when the water's coming. They build a, um, a rescue stair, and we pointed out over and over again that, that those stairs and that barrier is gonna lock the people in wheelchairs in the building they can't get out during that flood. So basically, NYCHA and the city is telling these people that you're stuck here, we're not gonna get you out. NYCHA lied in terms of um, that they said they conferred with OEM and the fire department. That hasn't been happening. New York City, the only fire drills that take place, and I think this has to do with evacuation planning, only takes place as required in commercial buildings, not residential. We learned from Hurricane Sandy when they evacuated people from old age homes, they, take them off, they took them and they dropped them off in front of motels that had steps that were left out in the rain for several hours before they were taken back. There's a major problem of leaving people out, people in NYCHA, people with disabilities, and also there's a problem with notification, that people with disabilities need special notification. It's not just getting an email um, you know, or, or some type of text that there's a problem. We have to look into that. And uh, so I also suggest that um, I also represent the New York City Community Gardens Coalition. There's new licensing ag uh, uh, pro uh, agreement that they're trying to push through. Th rather than s helping 
and, and, and build and bolstering all these volunteers at 530 locations, they're making it harder and basically pushing community gardens, which offer a lot of ground cover off their lands. Putnam Park, Putnam Trail in the Bronx, we're being told that we have, they have Parks Department has to use asphalt, not a non-pervious, non excuse me, they're using right, impervious materials. They're told that it's, 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 after studying it, it's basically a question of money. So for a few thousand dollars or whatever, we're using asphalt to cover a fragile area in the Bronx, it's one of the largest parks, and we're being told it's a budgetary consideration. That should be looked into. I, I talked about East River Park, but also the city council alone, you should hire more people for yourself in terms of environmental assessors. We had problems when we sued the city over, over, over the community par, um, garden in, um, boardwalk, in the boardwalk in Brooklyn. The city kept on saying that the, the concrete um, amphitheater was better, and we said, no, it's not. You're taking away all of that vegetation problems. But the city council basically went along, had to depend on New York City planning. I think it's important that every land use um, major involvement that you're involved in, that you have your own staff to give you a little more clarity. And okay. also, I believe that- Your wrap up. Okay. The other regulation that has to change is that we kind of stop this building of a right on large 80-story buildings, 60-story buildings, on the grounds that there's no impact. We know there's major impact, you know, and that, I think that's one of the first laws that we have to change. Also, part of the problem is that we go to court, we represent a lot of groups from dealing with the Excel building and other buildings. We're told by even the city law department, I don't think listens to any of these hearings here, whatever, that every action is just no impact. And I think that's one of the most important bits. Yep. And at the Excel building, when they built, it wasn't even the building, it was the excavation that caused the two buildings on either side to bend over and the people couldn't even close their windows. So we have a major problem here about no impact, you know, being false. Okay. So also one of the things I just want to say is that- Yeah, this is it. Okay, to add strength that there shouldn't just be one overseer in terms of resiliency, that each department should have a, a sort of inspector general, but also there should be an ombudsman appointed. So it's not just up to these community groups that have to foil and wait three months or six months to do it, that and within each agency, that there's someone they can go to that's a whistleblower, of a text of whistleblowers, that could actually represent the city council and all these laws and, you know, and be there from the planning stage up from the beginning, not afterthought and not post hoc rationalization. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, I think we are done. I wanna thank again, um, Samara Swanson, uh, Rick, Ricky Chandler, Nadia Johnson, Jonathan Seltzer, and of course Jessica Albin for this hearing today and all you guys for coming out. Um, and with that, we are adjourned.